mail order bride in the wrong hands. Written by Etta Foster and published by Starfall Publications. Available on our website in multiple formats. Enjoy! Chapter 1 Edith was picking up her cuts of meat at the butcher's when she noticed the glares. She was used to everyone in town eyeing her strangely, but this was something else. Today, they appeared to glare harder at her. Just as the butcher brought her meat, he dropped it rudely on the counter. Five dollars. Immediately, her attention was drawn away from the stairs as she turned to the butcher in dismay. Five dollars? I bought it from you last week for hardly two. Her hope was dashed to bits when the butcher just shook his head at her. Cost doubles for ladies like you. Ladies like me, she repeated dumbly. What do you... Edith looked around. A heavy weight settled in her stomach as she realized what was going on. Oh, well, I'm afraid I can't... Afford it. The butcher snickered at her as she hurried out of the shop. Stairs followed her down the street until she couldn't run any longer. Edith clutched her ribs as she gasped for breath. Whittington was talking about her again. They had repelled her for as long as she could remember, ever since she had moved in with her sister after their parents passed. The people had never liked her or trusted her, including her sister Lily. Lily had married Tommy Hortel. It wasn't the happiest marriage, and Edith feared she had only made it worse. Everyone loved rumors, especially when they were about her. Not a single rumor about her had a single grain of truth. Unless, Edith realized with dread, her sister started a rumor herself. If that was the case, there might be some truth to it. Three days ago, Tommy had sneaked into her room. It wasn't her fault. She didn't like Tommy, and she had told him. But he wouldn't listen. She was still screaming from the shock of him entering the room unannounced and unwanted when Lily arrived. Just like that, she had been blamed for something she didn't do or want. Edith had attempted to apologize, but Lily still wasn't talking to her. All Edith had found in Wichington, Louisiana, was heartache and pain. She didn't know what to do. If her sister had spread that rumor, it would ruin her forever. She walked as she realized that she couldn't stay any longer. There was nothing in this town for her. No help, no kindness, nothing. Edith knew now that she had to leave. It took her a week before she decided how. A bride ad she mused, while reading the paper that she had hidden under her bed. She read over the words again. There were two for Nevada that caught her attention. That was a faraway place where the rumors wouldn't follow her. But because it was a decision that would change her life, Edith considered the propositions carefully. There was a homely one that sounded charming but not reassuring. Then there was one that sounded better, more appealing, and promised a prosperous life. She liked the sound of that. She wrote her letter, stole a stamp, and sent it out. Writing and receiving those letters were the only things that kept her going. The atmosphere grew gloomier every day. She prayed morning and night to be free of the town. The state, too, if she could be so fortunate. Then that special letter arrived. She poured over it several times before she could believe it. Edith's heart hammered as she realized the time had come. She could leave. This gentleman would marry her, taking her away from this horrid place forever. It took all her energy to contain her enthusiasm. There would be a home where people didn't hate her, a town that didn't know her, and most importantly, the opportunity to be herself. She clutched the letter, twirling. She couldn't resist telling someone. Edith grabbed her bonnet, tucked her long, curly auburn hair away, and started walking. She hummed as she walked, ignoring the glares. For once, they couldn't touch her. I'm so happy for you, Louise announced, once Edith had told her younger cousin, who lived on the other side of town, her wonderful news. Louise was an energetic girl of 18 and the only person who didn't care for rumors. You're going to the Wild West. Oh, will you take me with you, please? Edith pulled back in surprise. Why would you want to come? I thought you were happy here. But there's no adventure here. Please? I'll do anything, Edith. She knew the feeling and couldn't bring herself to say no, so she told her cousin to pack her bags, for they were leaving the next day to head west. Their stagecoach was hot, stuffy, and dusty. There were several coach changes and horse switches along the way, 
But Edith and Louise had never felt so free and hopeful for the future. Before Edith knew it, they had arrived in Twin Creek, Nevada. She climbed out of the stagecoach and squinted in the sunlight. It was warm for early spring, with a dry heat she had never experienced. Two men came up and introduced themselves. One was the sheriff of Twin Creek, and the other was Leroy Nash, her future husband. Chapter 2 The day was already hot for a Nevada spring. Sweat dripped down his back. He tried not to be annoyed, but it only created another problem as Jesse tried to shift his uncle to climb out of bed. Curtis was nearing 70 years old, but his body felt like it was 50 years older. He'd lived a rough life and had grudgingly let go of working on the family ranch when Jesse took over five years ago. No. Just 10 minutes, Jesse tried. Glancing around the room, he frowned at how musty and dark it was. Everything was dusty, and the old maps pinned to the man's walls were yellow and curling around the edges. He and his sister Magda had placed an ad in the local paper about hiring someone to take care of Curtis while they were out working. But no one had come to apply for the job yet, and he couldn't really blame them. He pushed open the curtains. The old man groaned. Stop, would you? You're not getting me outside. I'll be dead soon enough. You can take me out then. Take me to Millie. Four years ago, his wife Millie had passed away. A long illness had kept her from getting better. Every day, he cared less. He became grouchy and needy and was never kind. It bothered Jesse to see his uncle like that. It bothered him more to think that someday he might end up like that. It made him toss and turn at night. Even though his uncle had turned into a grump, at least the man had experienced companionship and love. Jesse had just reached 30 years of age, and it was wearing on him. To celebrate that hard milestone, he had decided to place an ad for a bride. The days passed without letters or telegrams. He worked hard on their ranch, and as the town ranger, focusing on his work, as he tried not to think about the hope that faded day by day. It didn't work. Jesse closed the door as he heard his little sister from the kitchen. Magda was licking a spoonful of jam with a smirk. Please don't, he sighed as he joined her. And give me a spoon, will you, please? She rolled her eyes before obeying. Magda was at the terrible age of 13, where she was both difficult and a blessing. Jesse knew he was fortunate. He loved his family and he loved his job. The sheriff in town was a good man and he liked practically everyone in town. But there was still something missing. One more spoonful and then on your feet. He glanced up at his sister. Oh, really? You're telling me what to do now? Magda flashed a smug smile. Yes, I am. Don't worry. Uncle Curtis should be fine for a few hours. It took her another minute to convince him that was the case, but eventually she stole his spoon away and forced him up. Without any more jam, Jesse reluctantly headed out of the house. He waved to their neighbors before grabbing his horse to check out the borders of town. Bandits from Texas had been making their way west, according to the Texas Rangers in Dallas, and they wanted him to keep an eye out for them. It was quiet work, looking for what might not even be there, but he liked it. The day passed as he expected. A stagecoach passed by, and he recognized Juarez as the driver. They waved, but said nothing. Only when the sun began its downward descent did he start back into town. Jesse climbed down off the horse to walk. This allowed him to take his time and talk to everyone he came across. There were a few hundred folks in the town, and he tried his best to get to know every one of them. Watch where you're walking, Ranger. He stopped short, and his horse copied him as Mr. Leroy Nash crossed the road. The man hastened past them, glaring at him, before making his way over to the bank. There were two pretty women standing there waiting for him. Leroy Nash was a large man who owned a couple of businesses and had bought his way into power. Jesse liked everyone in town, except for Mr. Nash. Though he wanted to think well of everyone, there was something about that man that made Jesse worry. Shaking his head, Jesse tried to get the man out of his mind. He had no proof of financial wrongdoings, therefore no reason to cause trouble. There was more he could do with his time than complain, like help Mrs. Higglesworth. The elderly woman had lived in the back of the church since her husband passed away last year, and her children left for the eastern cities. 
She was just stepping out of the haberdashery with a heavy package. Whoa, Jesse called out. He gave a short whistle to his horse to signal to the animal to stay put as he jogged forward to help. Ma'am, let me help you. Mrs. Higglesworth was a kind old woman, half his size and certainly less than half his weight. She gasped as he grabbed her package. It had to weigh nearly as much as herself. Oh my, the old woman chuckled. Jesse, is that you? Little Jesse Quinn, did you just come back to town? He had left town to become a ranger years before his sister was born. When their parents passed away six years ago, he had come right back. She asked him this every time. Sure did, Jesse offered agreeably. Let me help you get this home, Mrs. Higglesworth. Jesse helped her get to her small home safely, and only once she was settled in did he head back to his horse. The animal waited there for him before they continued on. Though Jesse kept an eye out for trouble, there was peace in his heart as he watched over his community. Chapter 3 Leroy Nash was tall and strong, with straight blonde hair and a goatee. He was also twice Edith's age. She forced a smile when he tipped his hat and started his tour about the town. The sheriff had stayed a short while before returning to his duties. He's a busy man, Mr. Nash had told her proudly, but he always makes time for me. I can't help that I'm an important man here. His words rang true. Everyone made way for him, not wanting to block the three of them as they walked around. They were shown all the streets, as Mr. Nash pointed out, the various buildings. The man was very knowledgeable. Edith couldn't help but be impressed, especially when he mentioned how many of the businesses he owned. Much of what he said went over her head, but Edith did her best to listen. However, she did feel terrible for those who had not been able to keep their businesses and were forced to default on their loans. But it was kind enough of him, she learned, that he helped them stay in business with personal payments to keep their homes and shops. It's very complicated, she admitted. And the people aren't upset over your actions? Her heart went out to him for fear that he had been treated in the same manner as herself. If people couldn't stand him, for what they thought he did without understanding. He had just patted her hand. Of course not. They know I mean well. I help them as much as they help me. A few people stopped them to offer their greetings. No one had much to say to Mr. Nash, but they were very friendly to her. It sent a thrill down Edith's spine every time someone smiled. They were genuine smiles. No one knew who she was or had any suppositions over the type of woman that she might be. She couldn't stop smiling, even when Mr. Nash stepped away for business and left her at the door of his bank with Louise. She didn't mind too much. He's a very refined man, she murmured to Louise. I think he will be kind. What do you suppose? Her cousin only shrugged as she fixed her hat. Perhaps, but we've only just met him. Time will tell, I think. The two of them talked quietly about the people they had met until they heard Mr. Nash shout something in the street. Edith jerked her head up. She saw her future husband climbing up the steps with a flushed face. He fixed his jacket, took a deep breath, and smiled at her. My apologies, ladies, he offered. Edith nodded just as she caught movement out of the corner of her eye. There was a young man in the street with a horse. He had a lean build, perhaps as tall as Mr. Nash, and glanced up at them. He must have been the person whom Mr. Nash had just shouted at. She looked at the stranger wondering how he managed to be so calm. His low hat prevented her from seeing his face, but he hadn't even flinched at the shout. Mr. Nash, on the other hand, looked ruffled with red cheeks and a scowl. Who is that? Edith asked curiously. Mr. Nash glanced over as the man passed them without a second look. Ah, Mr. Nash muttered. Quinn, Jesse Quinn. He's a ranger. Trouble, I tell you. What sort of trouble? Louise piped up. Mr. Nash's frown turned into a smile. Why, what a day. Let us not ruin the fun by worrying about trouble. Why, I think perhaps it's time to eat. I've reserved my favorite table at the inn for us. Come, there's so much I haven't told you. He always had something to say, whether it was something new or something he had already said, but in a different way. Edith didn't know what she would talk about if he gave her a chance to do so. 
Everyone treated him very respectfully at the inn, and Edith did her best to look acceptable in his company. He was still talking when he finally led them down the next street to his house. It's the house we shall enjoy together once we wed. I have a smaller property I shall reside at in the meantime, Mr. Nash explained with a note of pride. Here, allow me to give you a tour of the home. It was a large home, possibly the biggest in town, and it was already decorated quite finely. She tried to imagine being the mistress of the home, and just the thought of it felt strange to her. When Mr. Nash returned to the front door and offered a farewell bow, she thanked him profusely. He left as she closed the door in disbelief. It's so overwhelming, Edith marveled with a hand to her cheek. Louise was studying herself in a mirror. Look at all this. It's finer than my sister's home, I think. The wallpaper is rather odd, Louise noted. This is much nicer than anything I would have expected. Most assuredly not a log cabin. Edith chuckled. Indeed, not a log cabin. Then a yawn escaped her lips. Come, let us go to bed. I'm terribly exhausted. The two young women talked as they found their rooms. They discussed their first glimpse of their new lives and pondered what might come next. Settling in bed, Edith sighed as her heartbeat finally began to settle down. She thought of Mr. Nash. He seemed like a good man, she told herself, so perhaps all would be well when they wed. Louise wasn't as thrilled, but Edith supposed it was weariness from their travels. Edith just hoped that they could find happiness in Nevada. If nothing else, she wanted a touch of happiness in her life again. Chapter 4 Jesse, what a delightful surprise! He hesitated before forcing himself to turn around. It felt too early for such attention, but Miss Olivia Keaton had a way of popping up in his life whenever it was most inconvenient. She was five years older than him and had been attempting to draw him in ever since he came home. He noticed the rouge across her face as she smiled from the book stand. Good morning, ma'am. He nodded to her and turned back to the Hendersons to make his purchase. She wasn't done. The woman laughed. Oh, Jesse, you know you can call me Olivia. We're dear friends, wouldn't you say? You're looking well today. I do love a good Wednesday. Did you notice how the town is abuzz? She continued. I think it's about Mr. Nash's bride. Though he didn't want to admit it, that had indeed caught his attention. Leroy Nash? He finished making his purchase of coffee beans before turning around. Miss Keaton shrugged her shoulders. Who else? He found himself a bride in the newspaper. Can you believe such a thing? He's been bragging around town all morning. She's the doll he was strolling around with yesterday. She's a pretty little thing, though awfully young. Can you believe it? Wedding bells are in the air, Jesse. Doesn't that just make you want to settle down with a wife of your own? I have to go. Jesse forced a quick tip of the hat before hurrying out of the shop. His mind was running a hundred miles an hour. He hadn't known Nash had been looking for a wife, let alone that he had placed an ad for a bride. Nash must have really wanted someone. Of course he would settle for nothing but a city girl, since the man considered himself a refined gentleman, above everyone in the Western Territories. But how did someone decide to write to Nash? He frowned as he fiddled with his purchase on the way home, frustrated at the idea that someone like Nash could have found a wife faster than him, especially through an ad. You most certainly woke up on the wrong side of the bed. Magda glanced up as he stepped inside and tossed her the coffee beans. She went to work with the boiling water. You look like you could push someone off a cliff. It better not be me. He grunted as he pulled his hat off. Is Curtis up? The younger girl sighed. No, but you know how he is. He'll play dead until he wants something. Why? Is something wrong? No, yes, no. Jesse rubbed his neck for a minute as he continued to stew. It didn't feel right. Nash had found a woman. There was no chance that she could be someone good, he supposed, for anyone decent could see Nash's true character. The man was power-hungry and didn't care about anyone. But now he was going to be married. Jesse sighed as he collapsed in a chair. For a second, he mused that perhaps he should just take Miss Keaton's offer. She might be the only option. But they had a lot of different ideas. He knew they wouldn't be happy together, not really. Jesse rubbed his face as he tried to think. Oof, someone has a thorn in his side. Magda set a cup of steaming coffee before him. 
Do you want to talk about it? No. He dropped his hands as he regretted his sharp tone. Jesse shook his head. I'm sorry. I didn't mean it like that. Thank you, but no. Talk to me about something else. What have you been up to? How is school? She fiddled with her own cup. It's all right. Mr. Hancock says I should attend a real school since he's not certain there's a lot more he can teach me. The other students are slow, so he'll just give me one of his books to read until it's time for me to clean up. I'll go help old Mr. Jones on his ranch and then make sure Uncle Curtis doesn't starve. Jesse paused from bringing the mug up to his mouth. She said it like she didn't want him to really notice. His eyes narrowed. What was that about Mr. Jones? His sister groaned. I was hoping you wouldn't ask. He offered to pay well, all right? And give me access to his library. You know he has a good library. Always bragging to the pastor about a new book he bought. I walked past his ranch yesterday and noticed how his chickens were underfoot. So I offered my services. We already talked about getting better help for Uncle Curtis since he doesn't like us. The ad was placed days ago, so I'm sure someone will come along soon to care for him. You don't mind, do you? Even though he wanted to tell her no, Jesse weighed his options. He decided he'd rather not give his sister another reason to be mad at him. All right, but I want you home before dark. You come home and don't wander. Is that understood? Yes, sir, she sighed. Soon they had finished eating, and Magda started cleaning up around the house before they left for the day. Jesse was just polishing his boots when someone knocked on the door. He jerked his head up. They never had visitors. Wiping his hands clean, he pulled the door open and noticed a vaguely familiar face. She wasn't from town, or was she? It took him a minute to realize that he had seen her last night walking with Leroy Nash, the bride. She had to be Nash's bride. He swallowed. Good morning, I... What can I do for you? Curly, dark red hair flowed all the way down to her waist like a waterfall. She was of medium height with the softest hazel eyes he had ever seen. Then she smiled at him. Good morning, sir. I understand that you have placed an ad. His heart skipped a beat. Right, his ad for a bride. Jesse slowly nodded as he wondered how this was possible. Perhaps she hadn't come for Leroy after all, or she had changed her mind. He wondered how she had found him. Right, yes, of course, please come in. Oh. Her eyes softened as she stepped across the threshold. Why, thank you, sir. You are Mr. Quinn, correct? I believe my intended said you work as a ranger? Jessie blinked in surprise. She spoke like she was still marrying someone else. The pounding heartbeat faded just as quickly as it had started. Disappointment flooded over him at her words. His mouth turned dry. I am, yes, and you are. Miss Edith Lloyd at your service. She had a soft, lilting accent that only made her more charming. You placed an ad about caring for your ailing uncle, didn't you? I wanted to see if the position was still open to ask if I could possibly be of service. Licking his lips, Jesse glanced down at his polished boots. They were cracking along the seams. He would have to purchase new ones soon. Right, you're new around here, right? Her eyes widened in surprise before he added, Welcome to Twin Creek. Oh, well, thank you. That is very kind of you, she offered politely. He hesitated, glancing down the hall to see if Magda was still there. Of course. Well, I... You're here to marry Nash, aren't you? Leroy Nash? Jesse turned back to her to see that the young woman looked taken aback. Only then did he realize how forward his question was, especially with the two of them being strangers. Perhaps I should go, she stated hesitantly. Jesse raised two hands up. My apologies for my forwardness. I don't mean anything by it. Only I'm not certain that your intended, as you called him, would approve of you working here. The two of us don't really get along, he explained awkwardly, and I don't want to cause any trouble. Her lips pursed together before unexpectedly turning into a soft smile. It's all right. I understand your concern. Thank you for your honesty. But I have already talked to Leroy, and he doesn't mind. That surprised Jesse, though he tried not to let it show. Oh, well, all right. He scratched his head. Then he glanced down the hall again as a groan came from the nearest bedroom. Curtis's bedroom. The man would be rising soon. 
Jesse pushed his thoughts of Nash away as he thought of his uncle. He had placed an ad out to all the surrounding territories to search for help in tending to his uncle in his weakening state. No one else had ever stepped up for the job. It wouldn't pay much, but the help was needed. Magda wasn't ready for such a daunting task, and he didn't have the time. He needed the help, and he knew it. And Jesse thought to himself, having a beautiful woman in the house couldn't hurt. His eyes trailed over her curiously for a moment, for she was not quite what he had expected as Nash's future wife. She seemed too calm, too sweet. All right, Jesse swallowed. Can you start tomorrow? Miss Edith Lloyd's eyes lit up in delight. Her curls bounced as she nodded. I most certainly can, sir. Thank you for this opportunity. You won't be disappointed. She gave him a short curtsy and departed. Jesse felt his heart skip a beat as he wondered what he had just gotten himself into. Chapter 5 She fluffed her hair and straightened her skirt before stepping into the inn. A young cook noticed her and waved, gesturing for her to choose her table. Edith glanced around before deciding to play it safe. Her future husband had a favorite table, so she thought sitting there would be best. It was an excellent seat, with a window facing the town square. She could hardly believe the table was still free. The cook made his way over once she had taken her seat. A few folks glanced her way, and she offered a smile and a nod. Good evening, the cook said. What can I get you today? I'm actually waiting for two more people, Louise and Mr. Nash, Edith found herself explaining. She'd never sat down in an inn alone before. I don't think I should order for them, should I? He hesitated before shrugging. I can bring you some water while you wait? She brightened. Yes, that would be lovely. Thank you. And do you know Mr. Nash? Edith asked before he could go. Her heart pattered as he hesitated. He's a good man, yes? She just wanted to know more about her future husband, but she hadn't had a chance to learn a lot about him personally, or even about how others felt towards him. The young man offered a wry smile. Of course, ma'am, if you'll excuse me. Then he walked away. Edith settled in her seat. Relief relaxed her shoulders. Her stomach had churned all morning when her future husband had talked about their impending wedding. Surely it was just nerves. She was marrying a decent man. After all, everyone must like Leroy Nash if they had nothing bad to say about him. The future before her was beginning to look good. She had a home, a man who wanted to marry her, and a job. They had talked just that morning about her taking in work to keep busy. It was strange to start anew, and she thought getting involved in the town would help her settle in. There you are, Louise arrived with an equally cheerful smile as she sat down. I am starving. How are you? How was your day? The two of them talked enthusiastically. It had been a few hours since they had seen each other. It was the first time they had been apart in several days since heading out on their journey. They talked about how Edith had just taken a job caring for an elderly man and how Louise was now employed as a seamstress. Ah, oh, my darling, you found my table. Perfect. I'll order us the roast. Leroy arrived without further ado, demanding attention as he joined Edith and Louise. The women's conversation was immediately dropped and forgotten. Edith brought up a smile. Hello, Mr. Nash. A roast sounds lovely. It's a perfect opportunity for us to celebrate. Remember when I told you about the job for Mr. Curtis Quinn? I was just hired. I start first thing in the morning. He beamed at her, a smirk spreading across his face. It certainly is. This calls for a toast. Now it reminds me about the time I had my first job. Have I told you that story? It's a good one. He carried on through the rest of the evening up until he dropped the two women off at the house. Edith slept a little easier that night at the prospect of a busy morning. She was awake early the next day. As she dressed and made sure her hair was brushed, she was ready to go. She walked down the road and arrived early at the Quinn home. You must be Miss Lloyd? She hadn't had a chance to knock on the door before it opened to reveal a sharp-looking young girl with long blonde hair and dark eyes. The girl grinned as she eyed Edith curiously. I, yes, hello. Edith hesitated, wondering if she had gone to the wrong house. Please, call me Edith. The girl nodded and then stepped aside. Edith, welcome to the Quinn home. 
I'm Magda, the sensible one who lives here. You were hired to care for my uncle, weren't you? Come in. He'll be awake in a moment. Jesse is tending to his horse and will be in soon. He told me you would be coming. Magda was a fiery young woman who moved with purpose, taking Edith's shawl and gesturing around with sharp movements. She walked tall with her shoulders straight. It was as though she sought to be older than she really was. Edith could relate to that. Sometimes she had felt like there was never a time to be a child. There were too many chores, and sometimes there weren't parents around to help take the load off her shoulders. This way, Magda called her down the hall. Edith hurried to follow. As she started, there was the sound of a door opening. She looked over her shoulder to see the man coming from outside. Jesse. He had to be a little older than her and looked like he'd lived a rough life. The poor man. He was tall with dark hair and a brooding gaze. Suddenly, he looked up and they met each other's eyes. Edith's heart skipped a beat, so she looked away hurriedly. Uncle Curtis? Magda had opened another door. Uncle Curtis, you have a guest. Jesse joined them. He has a tumor in his knee. He doesn't get up and can't care much for himself. Your job will include taking care of him and giving him any help that he needs. The blinds were pulled shut, so it took her a moment to see the man lying on a small cot. He looked old with dark circles under his eyes. It was a small room covered in maps with grime in the corners. It smelled musty, like stale sweat. Before she could mention that, the man under the covers moved with a loud grunt. What's going on over there, came a gravelly voice. Jessie glanced back at her and then opened a window partially to let the sunlight in. Curtis, meet Miss Edith Lloyd. She's agreed to stay here with you during the day to help you out. It's a pleasure to meet you, Miss Lloyd. But you'll be useless, he added. I don't need any help. I am perfectly content as I am. It's nothing personal, but I'm a dying man, and I won't be bothered. You're not dying, Magda sighed. You're just grumpy, and we can't stay with you all the time to make sure you don't fall over. Edith glanced around at the three of them. The two siblings didn't seem to care what he wanted, nor did the man care to listen. It didn't sound like a very happy situation for anyone. Certainly this man needed some type of care, though. She could see that much. Jesse cleared his throat. Miss Lloyd is here to stay, Curtis. Whether you like it or not, Magda and I would appreciate it if you would listen to what she says while she is here. Understand? It's nothing personal, but we want you well taken care of. Curtis' gaze fell on Edith. For how long? Jesse and Magda shrugged. Edith glanced around at them before deciding to step forward. She offered a small wave. Mr. Quinn, it's a pleasure to meet you. I'm here to make your life easier, however I can, and I'll stay as long as it takes. That gave the siblings the comfort they needed in order for them to leave. Though Edith didn't know much of what Jesse and Magda left to do, they assured her that one of them would return home before sundown to let her go and pay her. And then they were gone. She was left in the strange home with the strange old man. Inhaling deeply, she glanced around the stuffy room. First things first, we're cleaning up your room. Leaving it all musty like this cannot be good for your lungs. Why don't we take you to the fireplace? We can set you up in that comfortable chair out front. That's all right, he grumbled. I'll just sleep. She didn't let his grumpiness deter her. Edith gathered her energy to smile as she pulled aside the curtains from both windows and then opened the shutters completely. Light filled the entire room with a warm glow. It took her a little longer, but eventually she was able to convince Mr. Quinn to leave his bedroom for the parlor. As Jessie had told her about the tumor, she kept an eye out for the man's knees. He was very fragile in his thin and gangly state, but his stubbornness gave him the strength he needed to carry on. She wrapped him in a blanket in the main room before starting a fire. Curtis started to doze, and so she took that time to clean out his room. The blankets were washed, the room was dusted and swept, and his pillow plumped. She woke him up after preparing lunch. What's this? he mumbled as he started eating. That brought her hope. Edith sat beside him and kept him company while he ate. He eyed her warily but said nothing. Curtis needed a haircut, she noticed, and his clothes needed to be hemmed. That would be perfect work for the next day. You smile too much. 
Edith blinked. Or perhaps you don't smile enough, she ventured. She didn't know where such words came from, but there was something about Curtis that made her want to do her best, and she wasn't going to let him stop her from doing that. Fortunately, her response made him chuckle. You're a clever one. Not from Nevada, eh? Where did you come from then? Curtis's voice was a little coarse, with a dry, gravelly tone and little humor. But he was smart, even through his ramblings. The two of them talked for a little longer before she managed to get him to walk around the house and then back into bed. Soon, the day was ending before she could realize it. It was Jesse who returned to the house first. He stepped in quietly before spotting her cleaning up in the kitchen. He nodded and watched her for a minute before heading over. How was he? Did your day go well? She gave him a smile. Mr. Quinn is a gentleman. It was a quiet day, but I think he's doing well. He just needs some attention. That made him grin. I'm sure. Thank you, then. I was worried he might send you running. My uncle could definitely use some attention and kindness. He's had a hard life. Her eyes met his. They were blue, she noticed, a soft blue like a robin's egg. Her heart skipped a beat as she was reminded of how handsome he was. Jesse was certainly older, though not quite Mr. Nash's age. It was strange then to note he wasn't married. He appeared to be a good man who cared for his family and worked hard. He deserved someone. When Edith realized she hadn't responded, she mustered up a smile. Your uncle is a good man and I'm looking forward to tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. Quinn. I hope you have a good evening. Right, wait. He handed her cash for her day's work and then walked her to the door. The coins were put away in her purse as she headed down the lane to the house. Mr. Nash had said he wanted to bring her supper over that night and talk to her. He said he was looking forward to hearing about her day. Edith brightened at the idea of having her future husband listen. She skipped down the lane, hopeful for a real conversation, instead of just having to spend another night listening to him. Thank you for watching. Before we continue into the story, do us a favor. Hit the subscribe button. This way we will be able to create more audiobooks for free for you. Thank you again. Now back to our story. Chapter 6 Leroy Nash glanced out his office window, peering into the street. There was the pastor coming down the road, walking alongside Mrs. Higglesworth. The woman was worth nothing now, but the pastor owned a nice little pocket of land right outside of town. Then the mayor passed by. The man dressed in white suits and large hats, but he was almost out of money. His wife had two new hats, but they hadn't been out to dine publicly for over a month. They were living on borrowed time. And money, he added thoughtfully. Business was going marvelously well. He could hardly be happier. The pastor's fine young daughter passed, hurrying after her father from the looks of it. Her eyes fell on him and he grinned. But the girl, Daisy if he remembered right, ducked her head and hurried on. He chuckled. She was a cute little thing, shy around most folks, and rightfully scared of him. Leroy leaned back in the shadows. Twin Creek was a growing town with a lot of potential. He just needed to play his cards right, so he stayed on top. Leroy twiddled his thumbs. He had papers and account sheets set up on his mahogany desk. It had been imported all the way from France. The numbers on every page had already been reviewed three times, just to confirm that he was indeed making more money than ever before. And now that he had it all, he was also going to have a beautiful wife. Miss Edith Lloyd was prettier than anyone in town, even the pastor's daughter. She was attractive, young, and perfectly naive. Leroy chuckled to himself, almost unable to believe his good fortune. You're awfully happy today. The desk attendant, Ryan Dubois, nodded at him from the front room. He was small and slight like a weasel. Good news? Nodding, Leroy settled comfortably in his seat. I sure am. I'll be bringing in some new money soon. It's an exciting time to be alive, Mr. Dubois. Ryan's nose twitched. Yes, sir, it certainly is. I have private business to attend to, Leroy added when his attendant didn't budge. Would you close the door? Of course. Right, all right. Ryan disappeared. The man wasn't the smartest bird, but he knew how to keep his mouth shut. That was important. New money, gold. He could already picture the cool, shining nuggets in his hands. He had been waiting so long for news this good. 
When little Miss Edith Lloyd suggested she pick up work, he had motioned to two ads in the town's newspaper. The first one for a church cleaner had already been taken, but he didn't tell her. The other one was to help the old coot, Curtis Quinn. Back when Mr. Quinn was still on his feet, he would talk of the glory days digging in the California mountains for gold. Rumor had it that he had a map that would locate his treasure, which he never sold off. Leroy's mouth watered at the idea. That gold was his once he could find it. He would be unstoppable then. He could become the mayor of Twin Creek if he liked, owning whatever he wanted. There were so many possibilities that he didn't even know where he would start. Then there was a knock on his back door. Opening it, he found young Daniel Broker standing there, bouncing on his feet. Get in, Leroy scowled. The boy was a day over 12 and a clever thief. He had shifty eyes and shiftier hands. Leroy let him in and watched as the boy wandered the room, unable to stay still. I got it. I mean, we, we got it, Daniel Broker muttered. He circled the desk to set a pile of bills down before scratching his nose and circling the room. Wagon folks don't know a thing. That's all the profits. Folks were headed to California, they said. Jersey said they better not come back. Uh Uh-huh, Leroy grunted as he fell back into his chair to count the money. He counted it carefully once, twice, and then a third time, just to be certain. Afterward, he pulled out a small notebook to make a tally. Leroy glanced back at the boy. Is this it? The boy nodded with a jerk. Of course it is. Leroy walked over to him. I'm going to ask you again, and I want you to take your time answering me. I won't tolerate stealing, young man. Now is this everything you came away with from that wagon raid I told you about? Daniel Broker was backed in a corner. His eyes darted around before he could manage another nervous nod. Yes, sir, Mr. Nash, sir. Of course it is. That's everything. There was a soft quiver to his voice to confirm his honesty. At least he hoped that's what it meant. Leroy pursed his lips and returned to his desk. He sorted the bills carefully and then handed over $20 to the boy. This is yours and Jersey's cut. That's it? Daniel frowned. But last time... Last time you brought me my money on time. This time you're two days late, Leroy reminded him. He fixed his jacket and jerked his head toward the door. Come back next week about this time. I'm going to have another job for the two of you very soon. It'll be worth ten times any job we've done so far. Greater wealth than you've ever seen, boy. Daniel Broker's eyes widened as he jerked his head up and down. Right, sir. Good, sir. Next week at this time. I'll be here, then he sniffled and ran out the door. Alone again, Leroy took a deep breath. A cold calm settled over him. He was still in control. There was money now, and there would be money later. His money was counted one last time, and he made another tally before unlocking the bottom drawer. There, he put the additional bills with his most recent pile of coins. That had come from Miss Edith Lloyd's work for the Quinn family, though she had made mention of putting it to use to have a family in the future. He had made no such guarantee. He had promised to protect her money. After all, once they were married, everything would be his anyway. Chapter 7 Are you sure you don't want to join us? Jesse asked with an ear pressed against his uncle's bedroom door. The man hadn't come out for a meal in months, but something told him that things might be changing. At least he hoped they were. He could feel the man's glare. I told you I don't want to get up! It's Monday, Jesse reminded him. Edith is going to be here soon. Don't you want to show her that you're up and on your feet? He paused when nothing more was said. I think she'd be really impressed, Curtis. There was another grunt before he heard the floorboards creak. Jesse grinned as he stepped back. It took a moment, but then the door opened to reveal Curtis. It had hardly been a week, but the man was already looking better. His hair had been trimmed, his beard and mustache were clean, and there was no longer grime under the man's nails. He looked five years younger. Even though his grumbling never stopped, it didn't have the same passion as it had before Miss Lloyd's arrival. I guess I can come out, he mumbled. As he shuffled down the hallway, his shoulders were stooped and his hands shook. Good kid. But I'm telling you, that girl is unnecessary. Magda laughed from the kitchen. I heard that, Uncle Curtis. I like her too. 
He couldn't help but agree. Jesse nodded as he followed his uncle out of the room as the three of them gathered in the kitchen. She's very nice, isn't she? Nice and beautiful and wonderful, he thought. As though Miss Edith Lloyd knew they were talking about her, there was a knock at the door. Jesse paused with a spoonful of porridge halfway to his mouth. Curtis didn't bother looking, so he shared a quick look with his sister, who shrugged. It was still early for anyone to be on their doorstep, even if it was who he thought it was. He put his spoon down and hurried to the door. The young pretty woman was there. Edith gave him a broad smile. Jesse noticed she was wearing her hair down, which she hadn't done recently. He thought it looked beautiful. The curls framed her heart-shaped face. I brought your family a pie. Jesse blinked before realizing he hadn't said anything. Oh, uh, good morning. Please come in. You didn't have to, he added as she stepped inside. She was carrying something covered with a towel with both hands. As she walked past him, he could smell the sweet scent of apples. His mouth started to water. Good morning, Miss Lloyd added with a sheepish smile. I know, but I couldn't help myself. I wanted to bring one over to your family. After all you do for me, I had no other choice. Did I hear pie? Magda peeked her head out from the kitchen. Good morning, Edith. Do come in. You said pie, didn't you? The two young women giggled. Though Jesse thought to protest eating pie so early, he couldn't bring himself to say that. It smelled too perfect in that kitchen to be ignored. There wasn't a chance in heaven or hell he could work while thinking about what awaited him in the kitchen upon his return. Thank you, Jesse mustered when he received a plate. It was indeed apple pie, which had always been his favorite. And thank you for the pie, Miss Lloyd. That is very kind of you. It smells delicious. She beamed up at him. You're very welcome. And please, all of you should be calling me Edith by now. I only hope that this pie tastes as good as the first. Please dig in. Mr. Quinn, you were moaning about pie just the other day. So if I don't see you eating, I shall get very suspicious, she added playfully. That garnered a small chuckle out of his uncle. Jesse stared in surprise, wondering how that had happened. They looked like ready friends sitting next to each other at the table. He had tried everything in the last couple of years to make his uncle even smile. Now Miss Edith Lloyd here was getting him to enjoy apple pie. He marveled over the miracle as he brought a bite up to his mouth. Mmm, his sister moaned. It's so sweet, sweet and tart all at once. He had to agree. Jesse could hardly stop his own moan of delight. This was the best apple pie he'd had in a long time. The last one that he would have enjoyed had to be his own mother's apple pie. And that had been a long time ago. Staring down at the pie, Jesse wondered how she had done such a good job with the treat. His heart pattered, marveling over how wonderful she was. Not only was she beautiful, she was a delightful cook. Thank you, Jesse couldn't help but say again. This is very good, Edith. She looked up at him with that beaming smile of hers. I assure you it was my pleasure. I love to cook and bake. The best way to indulge in that love is to share it with friends and family. Another admirable trait, he thought. Jesse could hardly believe they had come across such a good person. He enjoyed the rest of his pie and stole another bite before hurrying out the door with Magda playfully chasing him. Once outside the house, he remembered there was another world out there. Jesse pulled his horse to head out to the outskirts of town. Even as he worked, he couldn't stop thinking about the pretty woman with auburn hair. She was a wonderful baker and just as kind. He had never met anyone as good as she was and couldn't help but suppose that there was no one else in the world like her. Chapter 8 Are you certain there's nothing I can do before I leave for the evening? Edith asked. She didn't mean to sound disappointed, only that she always worried that she wasn't doing enough. Besides, if she was late to her nightly supper with Mr. Nash, she didn't think he would mind. The Quinn family was special, she had decided. They were good people who were kind and tried hard. The three of them had accepted her more than Louisiana ever had, so she looked forward to being there every day. Curtis still played the grumpy man, but she knew it came from his pain. He had had a difficult life, and it had not grown much easier. The tumor in his leg caused him pain, and he thought constantly of the wife he had lost. He would tell her stories every day about his life. 
They traded them back and forth, but hers were small and meant little compared to everything he had to share. The love he spoke of for his late wife was touching, often bringing tears to her eyes. She knew it was hard to find light in a trying existence, but she couldn't let him give up. There was still a beautiful world around them. He was beginning to take short walks around the house, which she thought would help. Magda was a young girl, but with a strong heart. Though her brother made comments about how she needed to prepare for marriage and work on her skills and generosity, there was something about Magda's wit and attitude that made Edith smile. Then there was Jesse. She especially liked him. He stood out as the only one who never complained. Though he made note of occasional difficulties, he didn't let them weigh him down. He had a quiet nature and a sweet one. Edith thought of the way he spoke, for he could be shy as much as he was kind. He would stumble over his words and offer her a small smile. Every one of his smiles made her weak in the knees. Get out of here, Curtis sighed. I'm settled in for the night. Don't you have some place to be? Edith hesitated before she forced a nod. Yes, I suppose I do. I hope you rest well, and I'll see you in the morning. Close the door on your way out, he reminded her. That was his favorite way of telling her farewell, but she could hear the softness in his tone. She was smiling as she made her way over to the inn to meet Mr. Nash. Louise only joined them at the inn occasionally, so that she could spend more time getting to know her future husband. There you are, Mr. Nash stood up as she arrived. You're late, no matter, come join me. How was your day with the Quins? Edith offered Mr. Nash a smile as she tried really hard to picture being married to him. This was something she did whenever they were together. Yet, it didn't seem to get any easier. Thank you, Mr. Nash. Today was a good day for Mr. Quinn. We took two walks around the house. Can you believe it? And he even helped me with the fireplace. Ah, that reminds me, he noted as he waved down a server. I must get my fireplace cleaned out. It's a task that most folks handle on their own out here in the West. But don't you worry, Edith. There's no need for either of us to get our hands dirty. I have the money to afford it. Speaking of money, were you paid today? She had forgotten. Oh, yes. Jesse paid me before he left this morning. Her hands tugged at the purse in her pocket. For some reason, Mr. Nash chortled. He stroked his chin before taking the coins and counting them carefully. Jesse? Dear, you can't possibly be on such friendly terms with that family? No, I think it best to use their family names. Especially when we are married, I won't allow anyone to call you anything but Mrs. Nash. We'll want to present ourselves as the best of society after all. Edith shifted uncomfortably. Right, she managed awkwardly. Of course. But she didn't really understand. Mr. Nash was so businesslike in all that he did that it was hard to imagine him looking forward to being a married man. Though he had mentioned his thrill in marrying her, Edith didn't quite feel it. Perhaps they simply needed a little more time together. She hoped that was the case, as Mr. Nash started off on another story of his. As they ate, she wondered what love was like and how a marriage between two strangers could build love. It seemed impossible, though, Edith thought, there were definitely likable people. She thought of Jesse's blue eyes and wondered what he thought about love. Edith hoped that it was possible, but she wasn't certain what it meant to be in love. She didn't even know if she felt anything when she and Mr. Nash were together. He had been her ticket out of Louisiana, and that was it. When he walked her home that evening, Edith tried not to worry. Perhaps feelings for one another would come in time. If that was the case, she dearly hoped it would be soon. Chapter 9 when he was younger, his parents told him all about the different types of love in the world. There was the love of God and the love of Christ, of parents and their children, and of men and women. Jesse hadn't understood much of the latter while he was growing up. Although he had met pretty women during his younger years, they had all come and gone with little more than a kiss on the hand. All of them had been nice, but he hadn't considered any of them special, not until Edith. He couldn't put into words the way he felt around her, only that she appeared perfect and he knew she wasn't available. Even if he somehow convinced her of his feelings for her, he doubted she would take him. After all, there wasn't a lot he had to offer. 
Jesse leaned over the water trough as he washed the tears of frustration away. He had thought that the desire to find someone to love would go away with time, except it only grew harder. This wasn't something he could talk about with anyone, especially Curtis or Magda, who would certainly laugh at him. No, he had a job to do, a family to care for. If he never found love, then that was just how it was going to be. Jesse took a deep breath and turned to the house. He stopped, shocked to find Edith standing by the door watching him. Her lips were gently parted as though she were about to say something. Jesse swallowed, wondering if she knew where the dampness on his face came from. He wiped his face with his sleeve and prayed otherwise, or else he'd die of shame. I'm, I'm sorry, Edith managed after a halting moment. Jesse didn't ask her what the apology was for. The tenderness in her gaze was so strong that he almost couldn't move. I shouldn't have bothered you. She dropped her gaze and turned to go. He reached out to her, touching her shoulder, before he could remind himself to be more polite. No, you're no bother. Her shoulders stiffened as she turned back to him with a wide-eyed gaze. The sun set behind him. Though it usually made for a pretty view, he was more enchanted by her eyes. Light from the golden heavens reflected in her gaze at him. Again, he was reminded that women like Edith didn't come around too often in Twin Creek. Jesse forced himself to drop his arm. He searched for something to say to keep her there beside him. They were so close. How's my uncle doing? She cocked her head. He's well, I think, though in pain. He speaks often of his wife, Millie. A slow breath escaped his lips as he nodded. He nursed her in the last days. She was doing better, until one day she just didn't wake up. Curtis never had a chance to say goodbye. Jesse remembered the day it happened. His uncle had been so torn up that he had nearly gotten himself killed. He went through a lot of pain then. It was a very trying time. Edith sighed. He told me. They loved one another until the end. A love like no other, Jesse agreed gently. He took a deep breath as the two of them looked at each other. Searching her gaze, he saw something familiar in her eyes. It matched the hopelessness in his heart. Jesse wanted to say something, wondering why she looked so hurt, but he couldn't bring himself to ask. He worried about the answer. Chapter 10 Jesse had to be the kindest man she had ever known. Edith walked slowly down the lane as her mind wandered. She felt as though she were caught up in a dream, for it never felt like her feet touched the ground. After the way he had looked at her, Edith felt like she was soaring through the heavens. Though she felt vaguely aware of her surroundings, as she returned to the house to prepare supper for Mr. Nash, Edith hardly paid attention. She couldn't stop thinking about the way that Jesse had looked at her. Just that morning, Magda had mentioned to her that Jesse had put out an ad for a bride as well. Edith wondered what that had read like. Did he mention his generosity and strength? his lovely family, and the love he had for his community? She remembered answering Mr. Nash's ad for its appeal of a good home and a safe place. Now she wondered what it would have been like if she had answered Jesse's ad. Everything would have been different. Her heart hammered at the idea of seeing him again, and she could hardly focus as she settled down for her meal with her future husband. Mr. Nash talked for the majority of the evening, leaving her to her thoughts until he cleared his throat noisily. Edith jerked her head up and realized that the dining room had grown quiet. I'm sorry, she managed. What did, did you say something, Mr. Nash? I did, Edith, he told her firmly. His eyes narrowed as he studied her. Then he patted his mouth clean with a napkin. My, you're quiet tonight, but I'm sure I shall thrill you now. Our wedding. We have waited long enough, don't you think? We need to set a date. The blood drained from her face as she glanced down. Putting her hands in her lap, Edith gave him a nod. She had nearly forgotten. Yes, a date, she agreed dully. Right, I say it should be next week. There's no reason to wait any longer. After I close up the bank, we can go straight to the church. What do you think of that? Mr. Nash reached forward and took her hand in his. Well, his hand was fine and smooth, so large that it covered hers entirely. Edith opened her mouth to protest over how early that date was. 
But as she looked at him, her heart sank. She realized she had no other choice. This was the reason she had come to Nevada in the first place. She'd already had three weeks with Mr. Nash. Any longer, and people might begin to wonder why they hadn't wed. Edith forced a smile. Next week, then. She didn't know what else to say. Mr. Nash settled down and went back to telling her a grand story about handling business for the mayor. Louise came out from her room once the man had left to help Edith clean up. Of course, she responded when Edith told her the news. I was wondering when it might happen. It only makes sense. But you're sad, Edith. Isn't this what you wanted? Licking her lips, Edith shrugged. I suppose so. Or do you think you answered the wrong ad? Louise asked after a heartbeat. Edith jerked her head up. Her cousin raised her eyebrows. That's when Edith wondered if she had told her cousin too much. Nonsense, she managed. Leroy is a fine man. Fine man on paper, perhaps, but is he just as fine a husband? Sighing, Edith looked away as she searched for an answer. She wasn't certain that she had one. He's fine, Louise. I'm terribly sorry, but I have a headache. Can you wipe down the table for me? Good night. She didn't wait for a response before she walked out. There were too many thoughts in her head, and she couldn't do anything about them. Chapter 11 You don't want to read that, Magda told him as he sat at the table. I bought it yesterday and fell asleep before I finished, Jesse reminded her. Why wouldn't I? It's news about town. About Nevada, you should always stay updated on local events. His younger sister shrugged. All right, but I warned you. Jesse didn't understand until he got to the fourth and final page. Then he wondered how his sister knew. He glanced at Magda before forcing himself to read the announcement again. It was still there, no matter how many times he looked away. Leroy Nash and Edith Lloyd were set to be married the following Friday. Friday at sunset, oddly enough. Of course, that man would want to do something different than everyone in Twin Creek, something the town would talk about forever. A bitter taste settled on his tongue. Somehow, he had thought it would all go away. Jesse shoved the paper away and left the house. He wanted to be gone before Edith arrived that morning. He stewed over her wedding all day, wondering how she could do such a thing. She was going to tie herself for the rest of her life to a vile man. Leroy Nash was a crook. He couldn't prove it, but he felt it with every ounce of his being. The man was the complete opposite of Edith, who was good, kind, and generous. Though he was still debating telling her about him, Jesse returned home to find Edith there. She was folding towels as he walked inside. Looking up, she welcomed him in with that sweet smile of hers. Jesse couldn't help himself. I know you're meant to marry Leroy Nash. He blurted the words out as fast as he could. But he's not a good man. He's harsh and boastful and never kind. I don't think he'll be a good husband either, Edith. The loans he gives people are filled with lies that they can never fix. The man owns half the town because his rates are so unreasonable. The man is mean, and I don't think he is a good man, nor that he will be a good provider. Once done, he inhaled deeply. There was still so much that he could say, but he didn't want to do anything more to upset her. Already he feared that he would scare her away, but he told himself that he had to be honest. It was his duty to take care of the people in town, and that meant Edith, too. He couldn't let her get caught up in trouble she didn't deserve. She was quiet, her gaze studying him before falling to the towels. Her hands were folding the last one. She set it down carefully and then looked back up with a hesitant smile. Thank you. Edith said faintly. Her voice was so soft that he could hardly make out the words. His eyes followed her lips. I appreciate your concern, but I take my promises seriously, and I must keep true to the one that I made to Mr. Nash. I should go. He fumbled with his hat. Right. I... I'm sorry, miss. I won't say another word. She passed him on the way to the door. Good night, Jesse. Good night, he managed to mumble before she disappeared. His heart went with her. Part of him couldn't blame her. Edith was honorable and kind. She would do the right thing, even if it meant doing it for the wrong people. Jesse hated that. He had hoped that she would take his words as a caution and consider not going through with it, even if it was a promise she had made. 
but she wanted to keep her word, and he respected her for that. It only made her all the more extraordinary. Chapter 12 Edith giggled as Louise added one more ribbon to her hair. You don't think it's too much? Nonsense, her cousin assured her. It's the town fair. It's perfect. Let's go. The two young women left the house and walked across town with Louise chattering away about work gossip. Edith's thoughts wandered. It had only been a day since Jesse had told her about Leroy. She couldn't get Jesse's face out of her mind. He had said so much about Mr. Nash that she hadn't heard before, so she wondered about it. No one else had said any such thing about her future husband. Edith wondered why Jesse would warn her. She wondered if the words were true. And she wondered if he said them as the town's ranger or as a friend. There were so many thoughts going through her head that she could hardly walk straight. Careful, Louise chuckled, tugging her arm so she didn't slip in a puddle. You know, I'm sorry your Mr. Nash is too busy, but I'm also glad he isn't here. It's been too long since the two of us did something together. Come, let's go play a game. Edith forced her mind to clear as they hurried across the field to enjoy the fair. She ran across several familiar faces as they went. The longer she spent in town, the kinder the people seemed to be. Already, she felt she had made several friends there. Edith! She was listening to Louise's conversation with Roger Riley, a young man Louise had taken a liking to, when she heard her name being called. Edith looked around and found Magda skipping over. The girl had rosy cheeks and bright eyes. Edith nodded to her as she noted Jesse nearby, who followed his sister over. His steps were slow as he avoided her gaze. Magda dove in, talking excitedly about the chocolates she had just eaten, while Edith studied Jesse. He managed a small smile, albeit an awkward one, when he realized she was staring. Edith gave him a nod to let him know she didn't harbor any ill feelings toward him. It sounds like you've had a lovely time, Edith told Magda when the girl finally took a breath. It's nice to see the two of you out and about. And you, Magda assured her, you work so much. Edith chuckled, shaking her head. It's hardly work when you enjoy it. But don't you worry, for I am enjoying myself now. It's a lovely fair. And the town is lovely, she added. Everyone is very kind. I'm very lucky to be surrounded by such good people. The townspeople are lucky to have you as well. Her eyes rose up to meet Jesse's. Something told her that he was mostly talking about himself. A blush spread quickly across her face. No one had ever said anything so kind to her before. Just then, Louise broke through her thoughts. This time, it was with a loud squeal. The dancing has begun! Edith, join us! Roger, let's go! Soon, the Louisiana girl had kicked off her shoes and tugged her young man forward to dance. Indeed, a violin had started playing. She smiled, watching her cousin run off. Magda chuckled before informing them she was going back for more chocolates. The girl hurried away before anyone could stop her, hair flying in the wind. Magda! Jesse tried to call, but it was too late. He sighed and shook his head. She's... I know, she assured him. The two of them shared a look. Her heart hammered in her chest as she looked up at him. There was something so young in his face, and yet she could see a lifetime spent in those blue eyes of his. She wanted to ask him about it, about himself, about everything. In that moment, all she wanted was to spend a very, very long time with Jesse Quinn. Edith, there you are. The special moment ended as someone called her name. She frowned as she turned around, finding Leroy Nash taking long strides to get to her. Her mouth opened in surprise. He had told her last night that he had to work late and most likely wouldn't be there to escort her. Mr. Nash, I... what a surprise. A pleasant surprise, she added hastily. I thought I might surprise you, he smirked. Then he put out his arm to her. Shall we? He gave Jesse a curt nod as Edith slipped her arm through her future husband's. Then without another word, he led her away. Jesse never said a word. Edith glanced over her shoulder to find him watching her. She wondered what he was thinking. Her heart ached at the thought of him being disappointed in her for the decisions she was making in her life. She prayed he would forgive her. For the rest of the night, Edith couldn't get her mind off Jessie.
Chapter 13 Though he had never considered himself very imaginative, Jesse proved himself wrong all night long as he thought about Edith. It hadn't looked right to see her in the arms of Leroy Nash. Over and over again, he pictured himself stealing the beautiful young woman away to safety. Even after all they had said, he couldn't stop thinking about her. If she agreed to go with him, they could always leave town. They could start a new life in the mountains or move on to the next town. Perhaps he could even run Leroy right out of Nevada. But he knew every one of his ideas couldn't possibly work. He had a reputation to uphold, and he was more than just a thief in the night. Jesse struggled over his feelings as he headed home the following day, wishing he'd had the chance to dance with Edith at the fair. He came home early and watched Edith tidy the house before she left. They didn't have a lot to say to each other. His eyes trailed her every movement, wishing he could be by her side. There's no school tomorrow. The words came out just as he started thinking of an idea. Maybe he could convince Edith to break off the engagement. If she knew how much he cared, then she might. If he could show her what a happy and loving family could be like, perhaps she might reconsider her promise. I can stop by for lunch, he proposed. Why don't we have a picnic? A picnic? That's a fine idea. The fresh air would be wonderful for Curtis. That made him smile. Of course. And Magda, will you join us? She agreed, albeit hesitantly, but Jesse prepared everything he could so that she wouldn't regret it. Jesse made sure he had everything set up for their little adventure. They would walk just up the next hill overlooking town. One horse would carry their supplies, while another horse would carry Curtis. It went better than he had expected. Sitting down beside his uncle, Jesse finished eating his apple as he watched Edith and Magda make flower crowns. The two young women had bonded well. He could hardly believe how Edith was so kind and able to hold relationships with so many people, especially his family. She was just what they needed, for Curtis was doing much better lately in attitude and energy. As for Magda, his sister was calmer and seemed to be working harder towards everything she wanted. And he had never been happier. Jesse! Magda waved him out of his thoughts. It's starting to rain. We should hurry home. He glanced up at the sky. Though it had been blue only moments ago, it was growing dark. A droplet fell on his nose. Then two more on his hands. There was a rumble in the heavens as he realized they were in for a serious storm. Go on, Jesse nodded to his sister once their uncle was settled on the horse. The two of you start off. We'll be right behind you. He turned around only to find their pack horse spooked by a roll of thunder. The large animal shuddered before kicking out with a loud cry. Immediately, Jesse's gut clenched. If now they didn't calm the horse down, it might gallop off. But just as the horse stomped its feet again, Edith gave a shout. Whoa! A bolt of lightning stretched across the sky and lit up the scene. His heart pounded. Jesse watched in wonder as the young woman pulled the horse close. The animal shivered but began to calm down much quicker than he'd ever seen an animal do. Hurrying over, he offered his aid. You never cease to surprise me, he told her. Edith gave him a shy smile. I'm experienced with horses, that's all. She glanced around before rubbing her eyes. The rain was beginning to pour. We're going to be soaked, she laughed. So they ran. Breathlessly tumbling down the hill, Jesse ran alongside Edith as they hurried back to his home. The horse followed obediently behind as he kept a hand on the reins. The other hand held out for the moments when he or Edith slipped and struggled to stay balanced. Finally, he set the horse in the barn and turned to her on the porch around their house. Jesse could hardly breathe as he watched her push back her hair. It was long and dark red, with rain dripping as she shook her head. Seeing him look at her, she offered one of those breathless smiles of hers. Her eyes sparkled in a way that made his heart skip a beat. She was so beautiful. When her eyes met his, he couldn't think of anything else. There was something entrancing about her. He wished the moment would never end. His hand reached up, gently brushing across her soft cheek. One of her damp curls was carefully tucked behind her ear. He didn't know what to say. Just cherish the fact that they were together. 
He had never wanted anything more in his life than how much he wanted to kiss her in that moment. It was Edith who broke the stare. She glanced down and then shook her head in disbelief. A small giggle escaped her lips as she said, I thought it didn't rain in Nevada. He blinked and put his hand down. That had been a very forward move, Jesse scolded himself. Swallowing, he wondered what she meant by that comment. Says who? A blush spread across her cheeks. There was a flutter of her eyelashes before a sheepish smile found its way to her face. I don't know, I suppose someone who has never lived here before? The two of them laughed before Magda cracked the door open to offer them dry towels. After that, they were no longer alone. Jesse apologized for getting everyone wet with his idea for the picnic, but no one complained about the fun they'd had, not even his uncle. Chapter 14 Edith glanced at her reflection in the mirror the morning after the picnic. Braiding her hair, she wondered if she looked like a bride. She tried to imagine standing in front of Leroy Nash as she promised her life to him. She couldn't. With a frown at her reflection, Edith turned away as she grabbed her bonnet and headed out the door. Her cousin had already left, and now it was her turn to walk to her job. Her thoughts wandered as she walked. Mr. Nash had hardly a moment in her mind before she was thinking about Jesse. He was younger, more cheerful, and kinder. Then there was that smile of his that she felt was just for her. Edith walked up to the Quinn home, still humming and daydreaming. There were just a couple of days until the wedding, and she wanted to enjoy them while she could. Good morning! Edith smiled brightly when the door opened. Jesse was right there, with those eyes and that face of his. Though his clothes were rumpled and it looked like he hadn't shaved, he was as handsome as ever. She swallowed her emotions, knowing they would get her in trouble, especially when she saw Jesse's expression. Good morning, he sighed. His shoulders were hunched as he stepped back for her to enter. He was frowning, looking exhausted with dark circles under his eyes. Is something wrong? She started to ask just as she heard a shout from down the hall. The gravelly tone of Mr. Quinn thundered from the old man's bedroom. I'm not crazy, I told you. She turned to Jesse in concern, but he just shrugged as though he didn't understand either. He gave another sigh as he closed the door. He's been like this since dawn, talking about gold and dying. It happens once in a while, but today is, well, worse. Her heart skipped a beat in concern. Edith nodded, but she wasn't certain what that meant. Sometimes Mr. Quinn liked to talk about treasure maps and hunting for gold. She thought it was part of his past, intermingled with dreams. This was her job, and she cared for all of the Quinns. Edith set her bonnet down and hurried to the man's room. Where are my boots? He shouted angrily as she stepped inside. The windows were open and Curtis was fumbling around the room with his jacket half on and his suspenders dangling. I need my boots. I have to get my gold, you fools. Children, I'm not crazy. Edith, you're here. Quick, my boots. She hurried to his side and tugged off his jacket as she tried to think up a way to de-escalate the situation. Mr. Quinn, good morning. Have you eaten yet? Before you go anywhere, let's get some food. You could use some strength for the road, right? Then we can consider leaving the house. The treasure will make them rich, Edith, he insisted as she motioned to his suspenders. It's all on my map. Jesse and Magda need it for when I die. I'm not crazy. It's all on the map. We're rich, girl. Richer than California. He inhaled deeply and then asked her, Where's Millie? I need to tell her about the map. Edith paused, her heart breaking for the dear old man. Mr. Quinn leaned against his bed, perspiration on his forehead as he looked around the room in confusion. Though it took a while for him to calm down, Edith was able to convince him to rest while she prepared him some food. Jesse and Magda said farewell and left for the day. It was a long day, the hardest one with Mr. Quinn so far. He had moments of clarity, followed by bouts of confusion. I'm sorry, Jesse apologized when he returned that evening. Thank you, Edith. The sickness is making his mind unreasonable. It's never been so bad, and we're hoping that it doesn't get any worse. I hope the same as well, Jesse. She gave him a comforting pat on the arm and then headed out. Edith was thinking about it when she arrived at the inn to join Mr. Nash for supper. 
He had rambled on about his day for several minutes before he asked her a question. Edith, how was your day? Though she heard the question, she didn't think of answering it. Then she felt him nudge her hand, which made her jump to attention. You must have had quite the day if you're still thinking about it, Mr. Nash chuckled when she flushed in embarrassment. How is old Curtis holding up anyway? She straightened up. I'm terribly sorry, she murmured. I'm afraid today was rather difficult. For Mr. Quinn, that is. He's growing old and I'm worried about his mind, but... The dear old man was rambling about all sorts of things. He said that he was rich beyond comparison, something about treasure beyond measure, because of his paintings. Mr. Nash chuckled. His paintings? It sounded silly when she said it out loud to him. Her cheeks flushed as she nodded and picked at her food. Yes, he said the gold was behind the paintings. It didn't make sense, I'm afraid. He spent most of the day mumbling about his gold. There was a sour taste in her mouth as she shook her head. He raised his eyebrows. What? Yes, I'm not certain. I think I should try to get him outside tomorrow for some fresh air. Let's talk about something else, Edith mumbled. What were you saying about the bank earlier? It helped change the subject as Mr. Nash nodded and started to explain how he had decided to change the interest rates in a couple of months. But Edith held tight to her thoughts of Mr. Quinn, worrying about the poor old soul. Chapter 15 Jesse stepped outside as he took a deep breath. Then he hurriedly wiped his cheek dries of the tears that had somehow escaped his eyes. It's just exhaustion, he told himself. Exhaustion from not sleeping and not being able to help his family. There was a sickness in his uncle's mind that was slowly taking over the man's life. At first it was the body, but now it was the mind. It worried him. There was nothing that he could do to make the situation better. He couldn't ease his uncle's pain or get the man to relax. He had just left Edith there, and his sister had left several minutes ago. There was little time left until he needed to meet with the sheriff. But his uncle was having another bad day, and he didn't know what to do about it. Jesse had never felt so powerless in his life. His uncle could be a pain, but the man was suffering more than he deserved. Jesse cleared up his face and forced himself to get going. He grabbed his horse and headed out to see the sheriff. Riding in, as usual, he waved good morning to those he passed by. There was the pastor and his family, the mayor and his wife, and children hurrying off to school. As he passed the bank, Jesse slowed down to find there was a group of people gathered there. His brow furrowed to find Leroy Nash in the middle. You can do anything when you have the right amount of money, Mr. Nash was saying. Like the inn, I'll change up the menu once I purchase it. With new money coming in soon, the sky is the limit. Of course, that means interest rates will be changing soon. The man was always talking about money. Jesse shook his head as he reached the sheriff's office. It was disgusting seeing the man's pitiful existence. Edith deserved so much better than him. All he would ever care about was money. She should have someone who really cared about her, someone who wanted to cherish her and love her. He tried to focus on work for the rest of the day, but he was still thinking of her as he made his way back home that evening. It's gone. What is this? There was shouting as he opened the door. Jesse's mouth dropped open as he found his house a mess. Panic gripped him. Furniture was knocked over, and there were coals spread all over the floor. Leaving the door open, he grabbed his gun and ran towards the shouting. It's okay, Mr. Quinn, please, Edith was saying frantically in his uncle's room. But it's gone! Curtis shouted frantically. He knocked his table over as he grabbed the framed picture off his wall and threw it on the ground. Glass shattered and made Edith jump. Realizing it was just the three of them, Jesse put the gun down and then pulled Edith out of the way. What is going on? he demanded. Edith's eyes were wide open as she turned to him first in surprise and then relief. Oh, thank goodness. Jesse, I don't know. Curtis is turning this place upside down. He keeps looking for something, but, but he's knocking everything over. I'm trying. It's been nearly an hour. An hour? Jesse shook his head as he stepped inside the room. What happened before that? Mr. Quinn, Edith called out to his uncle. Please, 
Let's take a moment to consider our options. Can you put that down first? Let's talk this out. Then she turned to Jesse. I got him out of the house. I've been trying for days, and we walked all the way into town. He needed the fresh air. We had a lovely time, but then... Then I don't know. The house was a mess. I think someone broke in and perhaps something is missing. But I didn't think the map was real. Jesse furrowed his brow. What map? She shrugged helplessly as she answered, I'm not sure. All he says is that he can't find his map. I'm sorry, Jesse, but I don't know what's going on. Mr. Quinn? Sir, please. We all need to calm down. Your map must be here somewhere. I'm sure you'll find it soon. The two of them turned to his uncle as they attempted to calm the older man. Curtis pulled at his hair and pointed at his paintings and maps over and over again as he made his protests. When Edith finally managed to get Curtis to stop shouting and listen up, Jesse tried to tidy part of the room. He wondered what map Curtis could be talking about. His uncle used to joke about being rich, but Jesse couldn't recall any mention of a map. On the back of one of the paintings, he noticed a piece of old sticky residue. Furrowing his brow, Jesse touched it and smelled it. Candle wax. It would have been able to hold something back there, like a piece of paper. Slowly, he started to make the connection as he realized Curtis must have been telling the truth. That meant the map was really gone, and someone must have taken it from him. Jesse looked around the room and then went through the rest of the house. Magda's room and his own were also a mess, though not as bad. His heart pounded in his chest as he tried to understand. As the pieces slowly came together, he didn't like the picture they were creating. No one would have come to hunt us through the house unless they knew that the house would be empty, and it was never empty. A cold trickle ran down his spine as he thought of Edith. It couldn't be possible. But what if it was? Jesse gritted his teeth. His family came first. Edith? He stepped out into the hall. I must speak with you. Just a moment, she called back. I'm getting your uncle into bed. He stomped forward to the front room. His hands were shaking so badly that he had to clench them into fists. No, Edith, now. It was the only thing that made sense. She had spent all this time trying to get his uncle out of the house so someone could steal the map. If it led to treasure, then it led to money. And that's just what Leroy Nash had been talking about in town. Jesse could hardly believe that he had been such a fool, that he had been so blind. What is it? Edith arrived with wide eyes. But it was all a trick. She had come to them for the job just to help the man she was going to marry. He locked his jaw. There's no reason to pretend anymore, is there? Get out of here. She froze. What? Jesse, what do you mean? What about your uncle? Now she wanted to keep pretending. It only made him angrier. He had been such a fool for a pretty face that he hadn't seen what was right in front of him. After everything he did for the town and his family and for her, after all he did to be a good person, this was how he was repaid? He had never been so humiliated. You're not Leroy's bride, are you? Jesse demanded angrily. You're his beautiful thief. You did this. I can't believe I trusted you. I let you into my home. I let you get close to my family. Edith's mouth dropped open as though in protest. What? I'm not a thief. Jesse, what are you talking about? Please, I swear. You know me, Jesse. Let me explain. He shook his head, not interested in listening to her lies. He had too much to lose. You've been working for Nash all this time to find my uncle's gold. Well, congratulations. You found it. Now get out of here. Jesse stomped over to the door and opened it so hard that the door frame shook. But he didn't care. I don't want to ever see you again. You and Nash, you deserve each other. Edith stiffened in horror. Silent tears streamed down her face as she took a step back and then ran out the door. She swept past him like a blur down the street. He slammed the door behind her in disgust. But he wasn't certain if he was more disgusted with her for her convincing lies or with himself for believing them. Chapter 16 He wanted to laugh. Leroy couldn't remember the last time he had felt like this. He was a giddy schoolboy all over again with the fanciest horse in town. Rubbing his hands together, Leroy stared at the map before him in pure delight. Finally, 
he murmured to himself as he touched the paper delicately. What a darling. It's about time you were in my hands. The treasure was so close. He was going to be the richest man alive once he retrieved it. It had almost been too easy. Edith Lloyd was the most naive young woman he had ever known. She had taken the job of caring for old Curtis so eagerly, wanting to be of help, thinking of how she was helping prepare for a family. As if a family would be in her future. The idea was laughable. He had better things to do with his time. It was tedious enough bringing her into his life. She would keep his house in order and stay out of the way. She would be present enough so that everyone would know just how rich he was, able to bring in a wife from the eastern cities. Everyone was already impressed with her. The Quins were so gullible. He hadn't expected them to take to her so quickly. He had expected at least a month of waiting for a real clue. After all, he knew how patient he had to be to win. That foolish Jesse Quinn hadn't known what to expect. It was too ridiculous, Leroy marveled. If only the boy had listened to his uncle from the beginning. Everyone knew how Curtis Quinn used to like spending Thursday nights at the saloon, talking about treasures and maps. But the people in town had brushed it off without thinking too much of the man's words. They didn't realize what they were hearing all that time, those fools. That was the problem with the West. Everyone was so prepared to work hard for the rest of their lives that they didn't realize the opportunities right there before them. Leroy didn't mind. He was the one who seized the opportunities, since no one else would. He studied the lines and curves of the paper carefully, soaking it all in. It was a quiet moment with just him and the map. The rest of his office was empty. He had a dinner appointment, but he wasn't worried about being late. Edith would wait like the pretty little bird she was. All I have to do is solve this next mystery, Leroy mused to himself. Then it's all mine. Gold, jewels, and more. I could be richer than the King of England for all I know. With the map in his hands, he was one step closer to having everything he ever wanted. He could almost taste it. All he had to do now was decode the map's strange clues. Then he would have all the help that he needed to go hunt for it. Daniel Broker and Jersey would be more than happy to dig up an old box. It was their job to do his dirty work. He was the brains. They would get their cut $200 before and $300 after the box was in his arms. That was more money than the two of them had ever had from one job, so they wouldn't mind. They would never know. Inside that man's treasure box could be thousands of dollars, maybe even millions. No one else deserved the treasure but him. There was no telling how long it would take, Leroy pondered, since the map was vague, but he was prepared for that. Leroy smirked to himself as he straightened up. All those fools who said I would never make it will finally be proven wrong. Once and for all, they'll be sorry for doubting me. His parents, his hometown in Nebraska, every place in the Americas would hear about the rich and clever Leroy Nash. Yes, it would all be worth it. Then he put everything away. He stepped outside to hide the map in the shutters. Daniel Broker would come for it before sunrise and take it to Jersey as they had discussed. They would start working on deciphering the map to find that treasure. And then, Leroy thought proudly, the world would have to respect him. Chapter 17 Edith had made it only three houses down the block before the rain started. She didn't notice the first droplets since her cheeks were already drenched with her own tears. Then suddenly raindrops were falling all around her. She shuddered at the chill as the moisture slipped down her spine, but it was nothing compared to the pain in her heart. She'd been yelled at before. Her parents had done that, and then her sister and her sister's husband. Even a few townsfolk had yelled at her before, when they felt entitled to do so back in Louisiana. She had accepted all of it, praying that she didn't deserve it. Being yelled at by Jesse Quinn was another matter. She couldn't believe what had just happened. Wrapping her arms around herself, she gasped for breath. He had been so angry, so furious with her. Those horrible things he had said to her, he hadn't even given her a chance to explain herself. He had treated her like everyone else had. Edith shuddered again, letting the rain drench her. She didn't care. Her soul hurt too much. There you are. Louise swung the door open when she reached the house. 
Her cousin motioned for her to hurry inside. Edith, you're soaking wet. Hurry, hurry. She didn't have the energy to hurry, but Louise moved quickly, bringing towels and linens for her to dry herself. Her cousin tutted as she shook her head. Once the door was closed behind them, towels were piled onto her. Edith? Louise hesitated when Edith couldn't say anything. What is it? Is something wrong? Edith nodded and then shook her head. I don't know, Louise. I've been such a fool. Her cousin hesitated. All right, well, let's do what we can, shall we? Come sit down. No, on a towel first. It certainly looks like you've gotten yourself into a situation, haven't you? Is it Jesse? Is it Nash? Into the kitchen we go. Louise led the way. She could hardly breathe. Her chest hurt terribly. Every time Edith thought she was fine, she hiccuped and started sobbing again. I think I've made a mistake. Then she tried to talk about it, but she couldn't find the words. Still shivering, Edith gulped as she realized she had to stop crying. Louise ended up preparing a hot supper for her instead. That gave time for Edith to dry off and then compose herself. Then Leroy Nash arrived, and Louise disappeared into her bedroom to give the engaged couple some alone time together. Usually, Edith allowed her mind to drift during her time with him. As she played with her food, she wondered if she had imagined the idea of love all along. Perhaps love wasn't real. A knot lodged in her throat as she tried to convince herself that was the case, for she knew in her heart that something had happened inside her. Perhaps love was real, but it wasn't as amazing as she thought it would be. Edith thought of Jesse, but could only see the hatred in his face. He despised her. It was the worst thing that had ever happened to her. Mr. Nash talked all through supper. He had a way of talking that didn't require her to ask questions or even participate with a nod of her head. It never changed, not even giving him a pause. He talked on and on. Every day it was getting easier to mute him in her mind. Glancing at the clock on the wall, Edith decided she was done with this. She was exhausted inside and out. Her eyes were puffy and she could still hardly breathe. The moment Mr. Nash was done with his plate, she practically sighed in relief. Let me get that for you. Edith hastened to clear the table. She was just about to grab his plate when Mr. Nash grabbed her tightly by the wrist. Her heart skipped a beat. Gulping, Edith looked up at her future husband, wondering what he was doing. She froze as Mr. Nash narrowed his eyes at her, as though he saw something that he didn't like. She gave her hand a tug, but he didn't let go. Is this the face I shall look forward to seeing each day for the rest of my life? The question was slow, but clearly carefully measured. She could see the darkness in his eyes. All this time, she thought that he hadn't noticed. She had thought he was the one caught up in his own stories and words, but Edith realized she was a fool. Dread slipped under her skin as she tried to think of something to say. I'll be fine, she managed after a moment, choking on her words. It'll be, will be wonderful. Tension filled the room so thick that her stomach churned. She didn't know what else to do but yank herself free from Mr. Nash's tight grip. He left shortly after without saying anything else. He didn't have to. Edith walked behind him to the door and closed it. She wrapped her arms around herself with a shaky breath. Her mind was spinning. First Jessie had yelled at her. Now it felt like Mr. Nash had just threatened her. She couldn't put into words what had just happened, but she didn't like it. The way he had treated her was rude and hurtful. Short of energy and hope, Edith went to her room and collapsed into her bed, crying for the rest of the night. Chapter 18 Jesse shifted uncomfortably in his seat. The chair had never felt so uncomfortable, especially with his younger sister sitting right across from him with her harshest glare. He hadn't slept all night. After Edith left, Jesse had worked on getting his uncle comfortable and then he cleaned up the house. He couldn't sit still after that, so while it rained, he searched for tasks to finish inside the house, doing task after task until he collapsed in his mother's old rocking chair. Now it was morning and he had made it to the kitchen table only to have Magda stare at him. I have never been so ashamed of you, she announced. How old are you, Jesse? Five? I thought you were more reasonable than this. 
Sighing, he ran his hands through his hair. All of his thoughts were running in circles. Everything had happened so quickly. It was all a mess. Jesse wasn't even sure what to believe now that it was over. He wanted so badly to be right. Because if he wasn't, then it meant he had been terribly cruel to Miss Edith Lloyd. It could have been her, he muttered as he rubbed his eyes. She passed him a steaming mug. Oh, really? Tell me that you honestly and truly believe that Edith, our Edith, could mastermind a trick such as this. He inhaled while rubbing his face. Trying to get his mind straight, Jesse forced himself to forget Edith's pretty face. Because every time he thought of that, then he thought of the look on her face when she fled out his door. Edith was able to get Curtis out of the house, he articulated slowly. They left the house together, then they came back. Curtis told me before he settled down, the house was a mess. He said there was a map taped behind a frame. I didn't see anything, but no one else could have known where it was, or when everyone was going to be out of the house. Magda squinted at him. She looked much older than her 13 years right then. But you didn't see her take anything? No, he answered reluctantly. He wanted to explain himself, but she didn't give him the chance. His sister just gave him a look. And if she was out with Uncle Curtis the entire time, then how could she have gotten hold of this map? She could have told someone, Jesse reminded her. Like Leroy Nash. They're engaged to be married, Magda. I passed him in the street this morning as he said he was about to come into a lot of money. That has to be more than a coincidence. Magda thought about it for a minute, but still looked unconvinced. She's too nice, Jesse. Besides, there's always trouble somewhere. I know you were gone for a while, but Uncle Curtis was always talking about his treasure in town. He talked about gold and priceless things. I grew up thinking it was a fairy tale. He could have told everyone else around here, and someone could have finally come to look for it. Why would they wait until now? Jessie asked her pointedly. I don't know, she groaned. But what about bandits? Magda was grasping at straws, and they both knew it. You said some bandits came through and stole from the forge the other day. He gave her a look. No bandits live in town, so they wouldn't know about any map. Then he sighed, because this was the only truth that he could find. It hurt him right in the gut to believe that Edith Lloyd wasn't the woman she had presented herself to be. But he had been blinded all this time, and his family deserved the truth. I'm sorry, Magda, Jesse told her softly but the timing is too perfect to be a coincidence. She slumped back in her seat, out of excuses and ideas. Her eyes dropped down to her lap. She looked just the way he felt inside. Jesse drained his mug and then got up. We'll sort this out, he assured her. I promise. Until then, he needed to clear his head. Jesse headed out to ride his horse with the hope of feeling less miserable. The fresh air had always helped him improve his mood. Being out in the wild would hopefully quiet the messy thoughts inside his mind. Hopefully, it would ease the strain in his shoulders and the tightness in his gut. He would do anything to get Edith Lloyd out of his thoughts. Chapter 19 Edith didn't know what to do with herself. Part of her wanted to run away from all her troubles, except that she had come to Nevada just for that reason. Now she felt like she had only found more trouble. Is this all there is? Edith wrapped her arms around herself as she sat at the table beside Louise. Her cousin looked up with her brow furrowed in concern. What do you mean? The food? I can prepare more eggs if you would like them. No, no, I'm not hungry. But thank you, Edith managed to add. Louise was such a dear as she tried to keep their spirits up. She always had a way of smiling and making the best of any situation. The girl had yet to complain once. Edith had hoped her cousin would be able to make a life out here, but she hadn't expected Louise to be so much better off than herself. She didn't know what to do. Edith couldn't possibly go back to the Quinn house, for they would never even look at her. She just knew it. They hated her and despised her. Just the thought of Jessie yelling at her made her shudder. There were still the evenings with Mr. Nash. But she dreaded those most of all because he continued to talk incessantly about mercenary ideas. 
He was always talking about his bank and how people were always trying to undermine him. Edith left her cousin and headed into town for the haberdashery, scolding herself, for she should have understood sooner the type of man that he really was. She'd been so foolish, so hopeful of a new life that she didn't pay attention to the fine print that told her the trouble she had put herself in. Mr. Nash was taking this time to show his true colors. The man grew ruder by the day, telling her what to eat and cook and how to clean. It didn't take long for her to realize that he just wanted a pretty maid. Good morning, Edith nodded to the store cashier as she entered in search of new needles. The older woman nodded to her before quietly turning back to her current customer. Edith took the time to browse the needles and thread. Her eyes watched those nearby as she wondered what Jessie had said to the town about her. Edith had wanted to avoid being out in public, but Louise needed her help to run errands. But as she wandered around fearful that someone knew, it seemed no one did. They all treated her respectfully, so Jessie hadn't spread any such rumors. Surprise and relief found her as she decided to buy a piece of taffy for the road. It would help brighten her mood. At least that's what she thought. But as she made it back to the house and saw that Mr. Nash had delivered her wedding dress, Edith realized what she had been trying to ignore. She was still trapped. Even after attempting to escape Louisiana, it all came back to her. Again, Edith cried herself to sleep, praying for a miracle. Chapter 20 Jesse saw a familiar bonnet headed out of the haberdashery near him and wavered. He couldn't be around her right now. His hands tightened into fists as he restrained his fury and frustration. All he had wanted to do was head into town for a few supplies. But seeing Edith walking down the street only brought the bitterness back to mind. With pursed lips, he headed into the general store. He hadn't paid attention to what they were missing in the kitchen since Edith had started to help them keep track of that when she was still working for them. Though he hadn't told her to never return, the message had been clear. He thought back to how she had run out of his house in tears, as though she were the victim. Then he thought of Magda defending the young woman, and how Edith really could be the victim of circumstance. That made him shake his head. No, that would not happen. He dismissed the thought immediately. Jesse cleared his mind as he wandered in the shop to look for what he needed. Jesse Quinn, it's a delight to see you again. I fear it's been too long. Where have you been? Miss Olivia Keaton peeked over to flutter her eyelashes at him. The tall, older woman offered her familiar smile of delight. His stomach churned for his mistake at not keeping an eye on his surroundings. Tipping his hat to be polite, he tried to look for his items to make it a quick trip. Miss Keaton, it's a pleasure. I have been working, as I always am. Do take care. Oh, I shall, she hummed cheerfully as she came around to meet him before the shelves. Trying to dodge her, Jesse skirted around the cans to grab the wheat. He hefted up a large bag to carry out in front of him. Hopefully, that would keep some amount of space between them. As Miss Keaton popped up around the corner, her large chest attempting to keep him from escaping the corner of the shop, he wondered if he should have just turned and left when he heard her voice. Though she was kind enough, the woman could be more persistent than he cared for. Her air of desperation was only one of many things that dissuaded him from seeking any time or discussion with the lady. Miss Keaton beamed at him. What a good man you are protecting our town. Is there anything you cannot do? I cannot take home this wheat without paying, Jesse offered, hoping his tone was light enough so his words were not considered rude. He managed to smile before stepping around the next basket of cloth so he could go to the counter. Mrs. Homerson was covering her family's shop for the day. She was small and dainty, the opposite of Miss Keaton. The older woman gave him a broad smile as he set down his wheat. He stacked a bag of sugar and flour on top of them before giving her a nod. Lovely to see you, dear, she told him. Is that all for you today, Mr. Quinn? Jessie nodded, keeping an eye out for Miss Keaton. She was fiddling around with a pile of nearby ribbons. He turned back to focus on his purchases. He just wanted to get in and out. He had too much on his mind already to be dealing with more people. Yes, ma'am, he answered. This is all. How is your husband? I haven't seen him in the store recently. 
Is his leg healing from the accident? The woman beamed. Oh, it is so good of you to remember. My Abe is faring well enough. My boy, you are so kind at heart that it is a crying shame not to share it. Jesse wanted to smile, but he couldn't bring himself to do it. He didn't know what to say. He paid for his items and kept his head down. Of course, he wanted to share his love, but there was no one he wanted to give his heart to. He was alone like he always had been. Something told him that nothing would ever change. Chapter 21 It was a gorgeous day, warm and bright. She tried to find the beauty in it, even with the battle waging inside her heart. Walking through town, Edith took deep breaths as she convinced herself that everything was well. Perhaps the world would work out the way that it should. Everything would move on like it always did. And she would be alone like she always had been. Edith tried to hold her head up high as she walked down the street. She needed to fetch two pins and some eggs. Between her and Louise, they didn't have much, since her money was going straight to Mr. Nash, but they were doing their best. Just thinking of that man brought a sour taste to her mouth. She tried to clear her mind as she made her way back to the shop. The general store was her favorite store to visit. It was small and quaint, though quite possibly the most important store in all the town. There were bigger shops back in Louisiana, but she had never liked them. Whereas the general store in Twin Creek, Nevada, was quite perfect. The store carried just what everyone needed, nothing more and nothing less. I'll tell him you said hello, certainly, a familiar voice said as she started over to the store. Looking up, Edith found Magda Quinn in the doorway. She stopped short, not certain of what to do. Part of her wanted to hide. The other part missed the young girl, remembering how close they had become. Her throat welled up as she knew that could no longer be, for Jesse most certainly would have told his sister everything. There was no time to hide or straighten up as Magda spotted her. Edith, the young lady exclaimed. Carrying a basket in her arms, she started forward as though she wanted to say something. But before she could, a familiar voice called out, Magda, let's go. Jesse was just a few yards away with his cart and horse. He didn't even look at Edith once. He kept his gaze on Magda. Edith turned from Jesse to Magda to find the young lady hesitating before she slowly turned and went to her brother. She ducked her head as she went, shoulders hunched over. Soon the two siblings had everything settled in their cart and headed down the lane. And there she was, alone again. Edith watched them go, sadness settling over her like a dark cloud. She wished again that she had had a chance to explain herself. She wished that whole situation had never happened. If only there was a way to make that go away so everyone would forget. Finally, entering the general store, Edith kept her head down as she made her purchases and left. Everyone inside was as kind as before, with their greetings and smiles. Edith returned home and started to prepare supper. She watched from the kitchen window as her cousin was walked home by the boy from the fair, Roger Riley. He was a homely fellow, but charming enough to keep Louise entertained and happy. They looked like a lovely couple who enjoyed one another's company. It was hard to look away. All Edith wanted was something like that. Someone who loved her and wanted to be with her. Someone who said nice things to her and cared for her. But that wouldn't be part of her life. Instead, she had Mr. Nash. Though she had thought the man acceptable upon her arrival in town, Edith was beginning to realize how wrong she had been. The man was arrogant and conceited, so proud of himself that she could hardly stand the sound of his voice. That was all Edith had to look forward to for the rest of her life. Chapter 22 I'm worried about Uncle Curtis, Magda explained as they headed home. He doesn't remember the map. Sometimes he doesn't even remember who Edith is. Jesse's hands gripped the reins tighter at the sound of her name. It made his heart skip a beat as he struggled not to imagine the pretty woman. Shaking his head, he tried to clear his mind. He has bad days, Magda. That was bound to happen. And it's probably for the better that he doesn't remember her. I don't care what you say, Magda frowned. Edith was good for our uncle. It was all a mistake. He shouldn't have placed that ad in the first place. They hardly had the extra money to pay for someone to care for his uncle. 
And right now, in Curtis's current situation, bringing in someone new had not been the best idea. There was no need for the old man to be let down again by losing someone else. His uncle's health was declining faster than ever. That morning, Curtis hadn't even remembered who Millie was. It was killing Jesse, just as he knew it had to be killing the old man. Things were only getting worse. He sighed as he pulled up to their house. Good or ill, Edith is gone, Jesse reminded her. She's in town. You're acting like she left you brokenhearted or that she died. But Edith was right there, right there. You didn't even acknowledge her, Jesse. You didn't give her a chance to explain or tell you what happened. Whatever may have happened, she was good for Uncle Curtis. Wasn't that important? Jesse tried to rub off the tingling sensation but couldn't. Glancing over at his sister, he wondered what had changed her mind. She was beginning to trust him, but now she thought Edith was innocent? Jesse shook his head. You're not being reasonable. No, you're not, Magda huffed. I don't think letting Edith go like that was your decision to make. You kept it from me and from Uncle Curtis. The fact that she was good for him should speak volumes. She got him eating and walking around. But no, you're focused on some childish map trouble that we can't even prove. If you just gave her a chance. Stop it, Jesse demanded. He raised his tone louder than he meant to. Magda stared at him. She looked so startled. He thought she might cry. Immediately, he regretted his words. Sighing, he shook his head while trying to get his point across. I know you want to think well of everyone, Magda, but you don't know everything, all right? Her mouth opened before it clamped shut. Magda's eyes narrowed at him. Neither do you, Jesse. Then she stomped off, leaving him with their recent purchases. Jesse put everything into his arms. His sister was nowhere to be found. Magda made some good point, but she was just a child who wasn't thinking clearly. That's what Jesse told himself as he headed inside his house. It was hard to ignore the strange sensation of knowing that Edith wasn't in the house. She wasn't there, that charming smile of hers or her attentive eyes. Magda clearly missed her, and Jesse didn't blame her. Part of him missed Edith, too. Chapter 23 Edith sat down across the table from Mr. Nash. She tried to smile as she watched him pick up his fork and knife to dig into the roast that was prepared for that evening's supper. Having been in a hurry to get the food ready, she hadn't paid close attention to the recipe. Hopefully, the man wasn't very particular with his food, but she was immediately proven wrong. She jumped as his fork and knife clattered noisily. Mr. Nash spat out the roast. Dripping in saliva, it bounced once before settling right between them. The sight of it made her nauseous. Edith looked up in dismay to find her future husband glaring at her livid. What is this? he demanded, and swallowing, Edith tried to smile, but the knot in her stomach was too tight. It's roast. I, I might have put in too much salt, but I didn't think it was that bad. Perhaps I can just... He wasn't interested in her excuses. In one motion, Mr. Nash grabbed his plate and threw it against the wall. Edith gasped out loud at the crash, horrified at what had just happened. The plate broke into pieces as it fell to the floor. She stared in disbelief at the stain lingering on the walls. Her heart pounded as she tried to make sense of the man's temper, but even her ill-tempered sister had never been that furious. I'm sorry, she choked out. I didn't think it was so bad. You should have, he demanded. Stand up, Edith, now. Her legs shook as she forced herself to stand, wilting under his authoritative gaze. Trying not to let her chin wobble, she searched for words, but she didn't know what to say or do. She sniffled as a tear made its way down her cheek. She didn't mean to let it happen. As she hurriedly wiped that one away, another one escaped. Get me food, now. I won't have a wife that can't feed me. Get into the kitchen. I want something decent in front of me in five minutes. I mean it, Edith. Move. She hiccuped as she hurried away. Every nerve was shaking within her as she forced herself to run into the kitchen. Scrambling around, Edith tried to think of something she could prepare for him. But there was no time for a casserole and she couldn't feed him porridge. There was no more meat either, besides the roast she had just supposedly ruined. All she could think of to make so quickly were eggs. They were supposed to be her meal in the morning with Louise. 
but Edith grabbed them and set them over the skillet in the fireplace. She added another log as she prayed they would cook quickly enough. Eventually, the eggs were prepared. Edith hurried to take them over to him, only to remember that he had broken his plate. Not wanting to anger him any further by making him wait, she dumped her plate back into the pot with the roast and set the eggs before him. I'm sorry, she managed meekly. Will these do? He harumphed, giving her a glare. Edith couldn't help but back up, nearly tripping over the broken plate. She hastened to take her seat where she waited patiently for him to take a bite of the eggs. He made a face but took another bite. Mr. Nash finished his food in sullen silence and then stomped out without another word. Once he was gone, Edith let out the breath she had been holding. Tears streaked down her face as she brought her shaking hands up to her face in shame. It was so humiliating. Then she realized she had just set herself up for a lifetime with the man. Edith? Louise touched her shoulder. She must have seen it all. He shouldn't have done that to you. That was very mean. Edith, you can't marry him. Please say you won't. You have to leave him. Edith sniffled, considering it before shaking her head. How could I? We would have to leave. Where would we go? I don't know what I would do. I can't leave him. I made a promise, Louise. I can't leave him. But... Her cousin trailed off. A soft sob escaped. She rubbed her face, wishing she didn't have to hear the pity in her cousin's voice. Edith ran out of the room and straight into her bed. Never had she felt so helpless. She didn't want to marry Mr. Nash, but she could not see a way out. It was obvious now how the man dealt with something he didn't like. For her to deny him could only bring more trouble. The entire town knew the two of them were meant to wed. In her intermingled thoughts, Edith wished once again she had answered Jessie's ad instead of Nash's. Everything would have been much better then. She would have won his smile without such trouble. Chapter 24 The doubts wouldn't leave Jesse alone. In the dark, it was even harder, as he questioned himself over and over again. He couldn't decide if she was innocent or not. Surely she couldn't be. The coincidence was much too strong. At night, he tossed and turned, wondering. She could be innocent. If that was true, he had been much too cruel to her. But she might have done all of those horrible things to his family. Maybe she had tricked him after all. Magda's stubborn silence and Curtis's forgetfulness were making him question everything. The only truth that he could come to terms with was that he had been too harsh. No matter what type of woman she was, her disposition had shown her to be too delicate to deserve his anger. Never in his life had he spoken to anyone like that, not even as a seasoned ranger. He couldn't help but hope that she had committed the crime of stealing his uncle's map so that he had a justifiable reason to stay mad at her. If she hadn't done anything that he had accused her of, then he had made a terrible mistake and forced her away forever. Jesse made his way into town, thinking of what had happened. It was Friday morning, the day of the wedding, he could not get Edith off his mind. Even as bandits had started to sneak into town in the last couple of days, he could hardly focus. He was just heading toward the southern outskirts when he passed the town square to find a familiar figure walking down the street. Pausing on his horse, he noticed the familiar bonnet again. He couldn't mistake Miss Edith Lloyd even if he tried. His heart pumped loudly in his ears as he watched her. Perhaps he could talk to her. Maybe he could get answers from her then, so he would stop wondering. Before he could say anything, her name rang out. Edith, come here. Jessie couldn't help but grimace at the familiar voice. The whole street could have heard the shout. Shaking his head, he grudgingly spotted Leroy Nash at the bank. The man was dressed in white as he waved a sharp hand at her. Edith turned her head and immediately obeyed, disappearing into the shade. He was just turning away when someone called him. Mr. Quinn? He glanced around for the unfamiliar voice. A small brunette waved to him from across the street. She had a rough accent with a cheerful smile pointed at him. One last look at where Edith had disappeared, and then he rode over. The young lady looked familiar, but he couldn't place her name until she offered it. Mr. Quinn, I was hoping to find you. She inhaled sharply. I'm Louise, Edith's cousin. We haven't met, but I've heard a lot about you. 
Jesse stiffened, remembering vaguely a fond mention of the girl. He recognized the accent was just like Edith's and nodded. Louise kept talking. You care for her, don't you? No matter what you think she did, please tell me you do. He hesitated. I'm not comfortable discussing this. She just shook her head. I don't care. Neither am I, because it's not my matter. But Edith is, and I think you care. You were watching her, weren't you? No, I mean, I wasn't. That is, I only... Louise stepped forward, petting his horse's nose. Please, she pleaded. Whether you believe her or not, she needs your help. She trusted you. She cared for you. She still does. I know it. Even if she won't say it. She needs help. She won't talk about him, but I'm not blind, and I'm not a fool. Mr. Nash isn't a good man. He's, well, Edith needs your help. You need to save her. Please. Help her? He furrowed his brow quizzically. What's wrong? Did he hurt her? She hesitated. No, but he's not kind either. I can't explain it. But she needs help. She needs you. The idea of her running into his arms wouldn't come to mind. For some reason, Jesse didn't believe she would want anything to do with him now. His eyes wandered back to where he had last seen Edith. He hesitated before nodding. I'll do my best, Jesse said. Once I deal with the bandits, I shall try and help your cousin. Louise hesitated, but clearly didn't know what else to say. She gave a nod and left, claiming she had work to do. He did as well. As he rode to meet the sheriff to deal with the recent robberies, Jesse wondered about Edith. It's a beautiful morning, Edith offered to Mr. Nash as she reached him at the bank. I didn't think I would see you so early. I was planning to visit you after my walk, she added hurriedly. That wasn't the truth, but she didn't want him to know that. He was always saying now that she didn't have a job. She should spend more time cleaning or visiting him in town at his office. Apparently, that helped his image. Mr. Nash frowned at her. Well, don't. I'm too busy to have your chattering here. No, I just wanted to make sure you're ready for our wedding. Our wedding? Edith's heart skipped a beat as she realized she had forgotten about it. I believe so. Yes. Most weddings happened in the morning, but Mr. Nash hadn't wanted to take time from work for any such event. So the wedding was scheduled for sunset after he closed up the bank. Besides, he had told her when he picked the time, it would help them stand out from the rest of the town. He eyed her. Hmm. Well, the wedding is this evening, in case you forgot. Fix up that dress, would you? Once we're wed, you can't go around in shabby clothes. The lace is turning yellow, and I can practically see your knees. Go back to the house, would you? We don't need you creating a scandal here. So she left. Edith hurried home with her head down and her spirits low. That was the nicest dress she owned, so she didn't know what to do. She pulled out the wedding dress that Mr. Nash had bought for her and hesitated. You're not going through with this, are you? Louise asked quietly as she came through the room. Edith squeezed her eyes shut. I don't know, she moaned as she dropped the dress. What have I done, Louise? I feel like such a fool. Louise wrapped her arms around her. Oh, Edith, there is something that we can do. I promise, not all hope is lost. Chapter 25 Jesse worried he had been too distracted with women to do his job. The sheriff walked around the men they had roped together the bandits that had begun pilfering their way through Twin Creek. It had taken the two of them nearly three days to figure out where the outlaws were hiding out. But now, there they were, roped together like the thieves they were. Check their pockets, the sheriff instructed gruffly. I'll check their hideout for anything else, and keep an eye out for any more trouble. Jesse nodded. You too. He kept one eye on the sheriff as he headed into the cave before turning to the bandits. There were five of them. Three had started the trouble, only to be helped out by two local criminals. Jersey had been causing trouble for a couple of years and had brought a young boy, Daniel Broker, into the mix. Lately, they had been keeping their heads down, so Jesse had supposed all was well. He should have known that would not be the case. Walking around them with hands on his hips, Jesse studied the men carefully to make sure they couldn't move. Then he started to pat them down. From top to bottom, he checked their pockets and boots for stolen goods. He found coins, jewelry, and even a few papers. 
Nothing looked familiar until he noticed writing on a folded piece of paper. Jesse frowned himself as he unfolded it. His stomach dropped. It was a map written in his uncle's scrawl. Curtis's writing style was obvious from his large letters and straight lines. He could hardly believe what he was looking at. He stared for several minutes before he marched over to the man jersey. Where did you find this? Jesse demanded. This doesn't belong to you. The man stared at him with wide eyes, fidgeting with his pointy elbows and long legs. He mumbled under his breath before gesturing to the younger boy. So Jesse turned to Daniel Broker and crossed his arms. Daniel Broker looked around nervously before he lost his courage. Fine. It was Nash. Leroy Nash. He promised us big money, sir. I'll tell you everything. But I don't want to go to jail. A bad feeling trickled down Jesse's spine while he weighed his options. I think we can make a deal. You'll have to testify. But I'll do what I can. The two sighed in relief. Jesse got them ready to head back to town as the sheriff made his way out with two bags filled with stolen goods. It was a short journey back into town as the men were put in cells until further notice. Jesse left the sheriff to handle that as he took his uncle's map and climbed back onto the saddle. Though the thieves had no idea how to read the map, he had studied it on their ride. The problem was that they didn't know his uncle. But Jesse had grown up with Curtis and understood the clues and drawings. Too curious to wait, he decided to go find whatever the treasure might be. The map's hints took him halfway up the mountain into a small grove that his uncle would have been able to reach when he was stronger and healthier. Jesse was out of breath as he reached the spot and studied the picture of the tree. He looked around with his heart pounding. Magda had explained the stories that their uncle used to brag about that Jesse had never noticed. Curtis had talked about the best gold he had seen, about matchless treasure. There it was, an old willow tree. He crept below the leaves and dug around the roots with his bare hands. It only took him a few minutes to find an old wooden box. The box wasn't even locked. He couldn't help but hold his breath as he opened the container. Jesse stared in disbelief as he studied the belongings inside. There were several small items hardly bigger than his hands. A book with his aunt's name rested at the bottom with a locket and ring inside, along with a dried up rose. There were a couple more trinkets that he realized all belonged to his aunt, Curtis's beloved Millie. Jesse couldn't help but laugh, somehow relieved to find it wasn't gold. It was still treasure, but only for his uncle, and not for anyone else. Curtis valued memories more than jewels. I should have known, Jesse murmured to himself. He studied it for a little longer, lost in his thoughts about his family. Curtis had wanted his treasure, and that's why he had been so upset about losing his map. He hadn't wanted to lose Millie. Jesse decided it was time to take the box back to his uncle. Then he remembered what the thieves had said. Jesse's heart stopped. He had them talking on the way into town. Mr. Nash had planned everything. The man kept records in his office in a locked cabinet. He had taken the map himself from the Quinn household. Only then did Jesse realize what that meant. Edith hadn't done anything. She had been innocent, a victim of Leroy Nash's plot. Jesse scowled. He should have known. Then he remembered Louise's words. Edith was in danger. The wedding had to be stopped. He didn't know how, but something had to be done. Just then, he recalled that it was Friday, the day of the wedding. He looked up to find that the sun had already begun to set. Jesse climbed onto his horse and prayed he wasn't too late. Chapter 26 Edith held the bouquet of white roses with all her strength. She took a deep breath as she stepped into the church and looked around. There were so many people that she didn't even know gathered around. Everyone in town had been invited, and Mr. Nash had spoken to most folks to make sure they would be in attendance. It was supposed to be a special day, after all. Not that she felt like it was. It was a lovely day outside with the sun shining. Louise had stayed home from her job, taking the day off to help her get ready. They had brushed her hair over and over before dressing her in the nice dress. It was a light creamy blue with embroidered roses along the hem and sleeves of lace. On any other day, she would have loved the chance to wear something so fine. But now, 
It felt like a prisoner's uniform as she went to meet her fate with Leroy Nash. Mr. Nash. She supposed she would be calling him that for the rest of her days. He had never invited her to call him anything else. Edith looked up to find him dressed in his finest suit, a white rose in his lapel, and the smuggest expression that she had ever seen on a face. All she wanted in that moment was to run away. But instead, she took one step forward. One after another, she forced herself toward Mr. Nash. Her breath was short as she tried to feel her heartbeat. It felt like any moment she would fall over. The piano quieted as she made her way down the aisle. Soon she was just two steps away from Leroy Nash and a lifetime of misery. But she stopped as a running figure suddenly swept between her and her future husband. Leroy Nash, Jessie cried out. You're under arrest. A horse whinnied loudly just outside the back door he had come through. It was still swinging when she looked around in surprise. Edith dropped her bouquet as she realized what Jessie had just said. Put your hands in the air, Leroy, Jessie demanded. The game is up. You're done. Mr. Nash's hands balled into fists. You think so, do you? In one motion, he swept a hand under his jacket to bring out his own gun. Edith gasped, taking a step back and nearly toppling over onto a bench. She could hardly breathe. Clutching a hand over her chest, she stared at the two men in disbelief. You've stolen from my family and have stolen from this town, Jesse said loudly for everyone in the church to hear. For too long, you've made illegal contracts and taken everyone's businesses and homes without them knowing any better. Your tricks are done, Leroy. You're not taking a penny from anyone else ever again, and you're not taking Edith. Her eyes widened as she looked at Jesse. His eyes were sharper than they had ever been before. She saw the firm line of his jaw and the determination of his brow. He had never looked so fierce or handsome. Ha! Leroy cried out. You can't stop me! He put two hands on his gun to aim, but before he could, a shot rang out. Edith jumped in surprise and then watched as Mr. Nash cried out in pain. She was too shocked to move. The man dropped his pistol, falling to the ground as he grabbed his leg. He groaned loudly as he rolled around on the floor. Red stained Mr. Nash's pant leg. I'll get you for this, he cried out to Jesse, who held his own gun in his hands, stepping forward to remove the fallen pistol. You'll pay. Just you watch. I'll be free. I'm too rich to go to jail. Too powerful. Our iron bars can accommodate anyone, Jesse scowled, before reaching down to tie the man's arms. Any attempt to escape will result in more trouble for you. Behind her came the sheriff. He was a large man who glared as he went to grab Mr. Nash. He muttered something in Jesse's ear who nodded. The sheriff led the injured man away. Though the church was filled, no one else said anything. Edith's gaze was still on Jesse, unable to look away. Mr. Nash left the room, but it didn't matter. She felt her body tingle as she realized what had just happened. The man she was meant to marry had just been taken to jail. She didn't have to marry him. She was free of him, and it was all because of Jesse. He had saved her. As though he knew he was on her mind, Jesse turned to her. She felt her heart skip a beat. She opened her mouth to say something, but she didn't know what to say. Even as he marched over to her, Edith was speechless. I'm sorry. Jesse cleared his throat as he took her hand. Though he still looked as determined as he had before, his posture softened. He almost looked sheepish. I should have never yelled at you. I never wanted to hurt you. And then I put you in danger. Bye. I'm sorry, Edith. You deserve so much better. I only hope that you can someday forgive me. Edith licked her lips. She glanced at his thumb, rubbing soft circles over her hand. It felt so calming. She swallowed before slowly nodding. I don't blame you, Jesse. You care for your family, don't you? His eyes never left hers. He nodded as well before dropping down on one knee. I know it's bad timing, but I know what I want. And that's you. When you do forgive me, will you marry me? The hesitation only lasted a moment before she nodded. Her heart felt too full to keep away from him for long. She couldn't take it any longer. All she had thought about was Jesse praying that something like this could happen. All she wanted was him. Yes, 
Edith managed, unable to believe what was happening. She felt such relief at being free of Mr. Nash, as well as joy that Jesse believed her. He understood now how innocent she was, and he wanted to be better. No one had ever apologized to her before. Yes, Jesse, I want to marry you. There was cheering all around them. She had forgotten that there was a crowd. But she didn't have a chance to look around the room as Jesse swept her into his arms for a sweet, redemptive kiss. Chapter 27 Jesse knew that decency required they take their time getting married, except everyone in town was already gathered, and Edith looked lovelier than he had ever seen her before. The church was already set up for a wedding. It only took him a moment with Edith to convince her. I don't like to waste anything, let alone time. Her cheeks turned bright pink. You're certain? Jesse asked her, hopefully. Adrenaline still pumped through his body. He felt like he was flying. I don't want you to do anything you don't want to do. I have a lifetime of begging for your forgiveness ahead of me. If it's too soon, we can wait. Squeezing his hands, she pulled him close. Edith looked right at him as he began to meld in her gaze. I want to marry you, Jesse. You and no one else. I don't blame you for being angry. I would have been hurt as well. But you learned your lesson and you apologized. No one has done that for me before. I know you have a good heart. Let's get married today. They went back inside. Edith came straight to him and put out her hands. Jesse took them, not letting go during the entire ceremony. It was short but perfect. He never let go of Edith as the town witnessed them exchanging their vows. He hadn't expected any of this when he woke up that morning. Not the bandits, not the arrest of Mr. Nash, and not getting married. But he couldn't imagine a better day. You may now kiss the bride. It was just what he had been waiting for. Jesse grinned at Edith, who blushed again. He chuckled before pressing his lips against hers. Edith tasted sweet and smelled of roses. He didn't know how it was possible, but she fit perfectly in his arms. With the wedding over, everyone headed out to celebrate. They gathered at the Quinn Ranch with food and drinks that had been prepared and left at Mr. Nash's house for the purposes of his wedding. Musicians brought out their violins to play. There was dancing and singing. Edith and Magda even helped Curtis up so he could dance. Oh, keep him there, Jesse motioned to his new wife as he hurried back to his horse. He had forgotten about the treasure box. Grabbing it, he came back and beckoned to his family. Edith was there with them. It was such a small change, but it made all the difference. His heart had never felt so full. He smiled before bringing the box out for Curtis. The old man inhaled sharply. He took it with shaking hands, holding it reverently. My treasure, Curtis said with his voice breaking. You found it, you found it, oh Millie, my Millie. Magda and Edith glanced at him curiously before it dawned on them. They helped Curtis to a chair while he held his wife's belongings close to his heart. When he glanced at Edith, she was wiping a tear away. She noticed him looking and offered a sheepish smile. It's been a rather exciting day, she admitted. It has been, he said agreeably. Then he glanced around the happy celebration as he wrapped an arm around her waist. Jessie never wanted to let go of her, and he wouldn't. Not if he could help it. Perhaps it's been enough excitement. Should we retire early? Edith hesitated as she glanced around. Then she grinned and nodded. Yes, let's. She kissed his cheek before they headed to the house. The idea of spending time with just each other sounded too nice to wait any longer. Epilogue Twin Creek was blooming in early spring. The desert beyond town was colorful with the bold blue sky above. There were clouds in the distance that promised a warm rain by the end of the week. Hills around town were bright green, thriving and blissful. The world had never looked so colorful. Or, Edith supposed, it could simply be because she was in such high spirits. She looked around to find the boys as she stepped outside onto the porch of her home. Jessie had let her sleep late that morning, so she was hardly certain what time it was or where everyone was. Chickens! She looked over to find Uncle Curtis in his porch chair. He had his crutch on the ground beside him, a blanket over his lap, and a cup of tea set on the table beside him. Magda must have gotten up early to help him. The family had made it a goal to make sure the elderly man got some fresh air every day. Check the chicken coop. 
Good morning to you, too, Edith chuckled. She went over to kiss his forehead. Thank you, Curtis. Are you warm enough? He patted her hand. More than enough. Now go on, my dear. Go find that husband of yours. Make sure he hasn't gotten his head stuck in the coop again. Edith chuckled, shaking her head before turning away. She felt rested for the first time in a long time. She had plenty of energy now and felt like she could do anything. And more than anything, she wanted to find two people. She heard the laughter before she found them. Making her way around the shed, Edith found the fenced-in chicken coop. Joy swept over her like a warm blanket. Stopping for a second, she took in the sight and wished the moment could last for eternity. The wires did nothing to hide the twelve chickens and the little house that was painted bright yellow. Running among them were two figures laughing and giggling. One was much larger with his shoulders hunched over. The little one was on wobbly legs, wearing his father's big hat as he hurried about. James, Edith called out. She couldn't wait any longer. She fixed the bonnet she had haphazardly put on her head as she hurried over. There you are, my sweet. Immediately, the three-year-old turned around. Mama, he cried out with his arms wide open. Running to the gate, he fumbled with the lock. His father stopped to help him escape without letting the chickens loose. The boy was so big already and still growing. He had her auburn hair and his father's eyes. Already Magda's spirit was rubbing off on him as he sought to be independent and learn about the world for himself. But thank goodness, there was still enough of a child within him that he always came running to her. Her heart grew full as her son ran straight to her with his arms wide open. The hat flew off behind him. Edith laughed as he wrapped his arms around her. Pulling him up, she kissed his chubby red cheeks over and over until he protested. Holding him felt so right that she didn't want to ever let go. But eventually, she loosened her grip as he started whining. Don't I get a morning kiss, too? Edith beamed as Jesse walked over to her. He was looking better than ever, though she felt certain she had the same thought every morning. The man had clearly woken up early since he had yet to shave for the day, but the shadow only made his jawline more defined. She studied him quickly as she looked for any other changes. The last four years had been the happiest she'd ever had. Every day she wondered how she had become so lucky. Of course, she grinned at him. She put out the hand that wasn't carrying her son and tugged her husband close for a quick kiss. James broke it off, groaning as he grabbed his parents' faces. No more, he pouted. That only made Edith and Jesse giggle before kissing James until he was laughing as well. The three of them then turned back to the house. Eggs and milk were gathered for them to prepare and eat for the day. Jesse spent more time at home lately to work the land and animals while still supporting the sheriff. But over the last couple of years, they'd had less and less trouble. Edith was still counting her blessings as her cousin, Louise, arrived. The young woman knocked twice on the front door before walking in. Now that she and her husband managed the finest tailoring shop in Twin Creek, their schedules were never consistent. Louise's arrival was always a pleasant surprise. Louise, little James cried out as he clumsily climbed down from his chair. I missed you. Edith shared a look with Jesse. They suppressed smiles as they turned to their visitor, who was always keeping them updated with the gossip in town. Louise scooped her nephew up with a laugh. I missed you, too. Jamie, did you grow? You're so big. The two of them made faces at each other, giggling madly as she arrived in the kitchen. Looking around, Louise beamed. The young woman had never looked happier, especially with the large bump visible under her dress. I was wondering when we might see you again, Jessie chuckled. It's been a few days. Louise scrunched her nose up. What can I say? We've been busy. Oh, I have such news. You'll never believe it. Roger and I have finally saved up enough. We're buying Nash's old house. The nice one, of course, seeing as his original place was burned down. I still don't know who it was. I thought certainly someone would have confessed by now. She took a seat with James in her arms as she talked on about all the changes they wanted for the new house. It sounded like it would make a lovely home. Edith just hoped it would be ready in time. The bump under her cousin's dress was growing quickly with only a few short months left to go. 
her eyes wandered over to her husband, who offered a short nod. He would offer help in making sure their house was ready to be inhabited when the child came. He was good at that, making sure people were well taken care of. It made him the perfect husband and the perfect man. Jesse had spent every day of their marriage trying his very best. He had made good on his promise to her on their wedding day. All of her life had been spent trying to find a place where she could live freely. She wanted to be happy and independent without cruelty. Every day since becoming part of the Quinn family, that had been the case. The past had been worth it, if only to reach this point. Every morning and every evening, she thanked the Lord for how fortunate she had become. Oh, Louise stood up as James ran off with one of his wooden toys. I almost forgot. Guess who I saw Magda talking to the other day? The school teacher's boy, William. Can you believe it? I should have known. Jessie straightened up. What did you just say? Just talking? Edith interceded quickly. She gave her husband a look, reminding him not to be bothered. Magda is as rebellious and stubborn as always. But it doesn't mean trouble. Surely they're just friends. She's been helping out there for years. Louise shrugged. I just think they may have been rather close for having a normal and friendly conversation. Keep an eye out for Friday's barn dance. It's just a suggestion. I think you'll see a thing or two. That was not what Jesse was looking for. Edith rolled her eyes as her husband stood up with a frown. But Louise didn't notice as she kissed James goodbye and waved before heading out the door. There was always work to be done, so her visits often ended as abruptly as they started. They could just be friends. Edith turned to Jesse with a pointed look. Already he was stewing over what her cousin had said. I don't know. I don't like that. William should have come to me first. I'm her brother. What if he's courting her? I should know about anything to do with Magda. She could get her heart broken. It's trouble. Edith took his hand in hers. Magda is trouble. We already know that. But she's not a fool, and we know that as well. She won't get into any more trouble than usual. Besides, there's no reason for you to be mad at her. Ever since I met you, you've been wanting her to get married. Has something changed? No, Jesse admitted, but... But nothing, she shook her head. I've met William before. He sits two rows ahead of us at church with his parents. He is well-behaved. For all we know, he's a fine young man. Perhaps he'll be what she needs to straighten up, hmm? He stewed over that idea, then grudgingly he nodded. I suppose that's possible, Jesse mumbled. His hand settled on her shoulder, rubbing it softly. She leaned into him and wrapped her arms around his chest. Maybe you are right. Of course I am, she joked. She giggled as he kissed her forehead. She could hear their son in the next room playing with his toys, making animal noises as though to let them know that he was well. It was music to her ears. Jesse took her in his arms. He smelled like fresh hay as he embraced her. The world disappeared. Her soul relaxed with him right there with her. This was just where she belonged, with Jesse. She didn't want to ever move. The kiss he placed on her forehead told her that he agreed. Tilting her head up, Edith welcomed more kisses. He put one on her nose, and then finally on her lips. There was still a spark between them. Somehow, she never got tired of him. A tingle ran up and down her spine. She felt so content that she found herself certain that heaven must feel like how she felt in her husband's arms. How are you feeling? Jesse settled his chin on top of her forehead. She opened her eyes to find herself pressed against his chest. Smiling, she sighed. Wonderful, just wonderful. And I have a surprise for you. Oh, are you making pie? He asked her, full of hope. No, guess again, Edith decided as she leaned back to look at him. It's an even better surprise. His eyes widened in mock surprise before furrowing his brow. Hmm, what could possibly be better than your pie? That made her giggle as she shook her head. It's not food, Edith informed him. Then she flattened his collar. It's even better. Better than food? That doesn't sound possible. She rolled her eyes at his playfulness. Definitely better, she assured him. Do you remember how tired I have been lately? Jesse nodded. I was getting worried about you, Edith. I've been thinking about hiring some help. We can afford it now, and it would give you more time with James. Both of us could have more time with James and Curtis. 
More time as a family. Her lips twitched. Right, a family, a growing family. She stated firmly as she took one of his hands and put it on her stomach. It took six seconds before his eyes widened. Oh, oh, really? And she nodded quickly. I didn't want to spoil Louise's cheer with her first child. Besides, I wanted to be certain. But I am now. I'm certain of it. James is going to become a big brother before Christmas. Jesse wrapped her in his arms and spun her around. She felt like she was flying, filled with all the joy in her heart. The feeling didn't go away as he set her down. Everything was so wonderful. Twin Creek had become her home in a way that she had never expected. Jesse had changed everything for her. He had welcomed her into his life and his family with love she had never known before. I'm the luckiest person alive, Jesse whispered to her as he pressed his forehead against hers. Edith smiled. So am I, she whispered back. Read an unexpected bride for his haunted heart now. Scan the QR code or click on the link in the description to read the next book in the series. Share this video with your friend or watch on of the following videos. Subscribe to our channel, like this video and hit the notification bell to not miss any new audiobooks. Thank you for watching.